The following is a conversation with Matt Coughlin, who has photographed for some of the biggest brands in the world, as well as some of the biggest athletes in the world. Oakley, Bose, Patrick Mahomes, Aaron Rodgers. Now, it didn't all start here. He started working a nine to five job for a law firm in our local town, not in New York or San Francisco or LA. So how did he get to where he's at? In this video, we're gonna talk all about that. Enjoy. So tell me about the first photograph that you took where you knew this is what you wanted to do. Uh, the first photograph I took where I knew this is what I wanted to do um, would probably be, I don't know, my story's super interesting. Um, there, uh, there's two parts to that, or two answers to that question. Yeah. Um, I originally picked up a camera just to kind of learn photography and take pictures of my kids. Um, and I was borrowing a camera from work and just taking it home on the weekends. Um, and back in 2011, I started one of those like three, six, five projects where you take up like a portrait every day of something. Um, and that is sort of what propelled me on the trajectory to like where I am. Um, so January 1st, 2011, probably was like a self portrait I took, which I cringe at now um, and did back then, but I made myself do it to start the project um, and grew it from there. Um, but we could probably get more into this, um, you know, as you ask questions. But in 2013, um, when I got my first assignment from ESPN, the magazine was when I realized that um, I'm, I needed to take the leap to do it full time and go after it. And that was probably, um, you know, what we're, what we've been talking about internally. Um, it's the 10 year mark of when that happened. And that was the moment I realized that like, okay, I can do this. When you say 10 year mark. So you said 2011, 2011 is when I 13. sort of just decided to, yeah, to start messing around with photography. Okay. And then 2013, when I got my first assignment with ESPN, the magazine was when I realized. Was that a personal assignment or was it still through your work? Um, what were you doing for work when you started? I worked, uh, I worked for the Levin Papantonio law firm for almost 10 years as like a multimedia, um, okay. specialist. Um, and so I was just working doing, I started out doing, um, like deposition videos and editing depositions, recording them. I would travel all over the country and sit in trials for months at a time. Oh my word. Yeah. Um, so literally just documentation. Content. Yeah. Yeah. But I had a I mean, creative brain, creative eye. So like I would go above and beyond in the courtroom doing like animations and stuff for the, the lawyers. And like, I mean, I was just pushing myself cause it was like, I really liked the people I worked with and the subject matter of law was interesting and getting to see, um, the, uh, being in a trial and, and stuff was interesting. But at the end of the day, the, the work product itself was very boring. And I don't mean that in like an insulting way, but yeah. for me, it just was, I just always had that feeling like this isn't what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. Um, but it was a very comfortable, safe job having, you know, kids in a house. Um, but once I sort of discovered photography, I found a creative outlet to push myself. Do you think the boring was a benefit because it was stable? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, you could, you could say it was a benefit. It was, I mean, I was in a nine to five world, working a job, getting a paycheck as a W2 employee yeah. and I mean, working for a company that had been around for a long time. So it was very safe. Yeah. Did was it living in a safe world. That, yeah. like, that, like, uh, that level of like freedom to go and then now start pursuing something because you knew like you were taken care of, like how important was that? Or would it, is it just as important to maybe for somebody to jump out on their own and kind of risk everything? Or do you think there was some intelligence in the business side of things to work your way into for it? For me, it was very calculated, uh, the way uh, the steps that I took to get to, to start off, um, because I had a family, I had, um, two children, um, at the time when, um, this began, I was ready to jump ship and just go out on my own. And then in 2012, when we found out we we're having our third kid, I was like, 
I can't just abandon this job and go for it. I need to make sure my family's safe. And we were at the time trying to buy a house also. Okay. So um, I didn't have the luxury. It's not that I didn't have the luxury. I tried to make the best decisions for my family to, to see if I could pursue this as a career. Um, so yeah, from the business perspective, I stuck with it as long as I can, as long as I could. Um, and then going back to that photo shoot in 2013 with ESPN, the magazine, that was when I realized that it was a, that I needed to do this full time and I can do this full time. And so I went one more year working at the law firm and used all of my sick leave, vacation leave um, to go do assignments. And then it got to the point where they would let me, as long as my work was getting done, I mean, I, I was an hourly employee, but it got, when I used up all my leave time, it was, you know, on me to just make sure the work got done. But I was risking taking time off, not getting paid to go do assignments. Yeah. And then in 2014, when I got busy enough is when I decided to take the leap full time. So you, you start the photos in 2011. What, what did you shoot? You shot yourself day one. How quickly did you scale up, so to speak, the, uh, the people you were photographing? I'm sure you went like yourself, your wife, your children. Like, and where did, how, how quickly did that escalate? Because in two years, you're shooting for ESPN. That seems like madness. So um, my wife is probably the last person I photographed. Okay. So yeah, she, she would not, she never wanted to be in front of the camera. Okay. Um, no, it started with myself uh, because it was, I, I might have done a picture of one of my kids that day. I don't remember. I, I just remember that day was pouring rain outside. But it was one of those, I, I told myself I was gonna do this project, so I just sucked it up and did a self-portrait, which is the most, it's funny because now uh, kids, all they do is selfies and stuff. To totally. me, taking a self-portrait is like the cringiest thing in the world. <laughs> just sitting here in front of a camera is difficult. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's funny for me to say that because that's all I do is point cameras at people. Yeah. Um, so I recognize how uncomfortable that is and then taking a picture of yourself, I, that's, that's rough. Um, but. <laughs> To answer your question, um, no, so I, I would, having a full-time job, I would take my lunch break and I walked up Palafox and I would approach complete strangers. So you got, went street photography? Well, no, it wasn't, it was still portraiture though. Okay. It wasn't like, I wasn't taking street street photos like with a long lens. Oh, no, like okay. I would straight up walk up to be like, hey dude, I like your glasses, you got a cool look, your hairstyle is neat. Can I take 10 minutes with you and just take a portrait? And I would have like, I would, carry lights with me Dang. and have strobes and like I would just straight up do a photo shoot on the sidewalk on Palafox. Wow. So yeah. you you quickly went all in on trying to master like lighting, yes. settings, approaching yep. people. Yes. I got addicted to light. It was more like it was when I discovered how to use uh, strobes and light. It was it was to me that was more of what I was addicted to rather than the I mean, that's all part of the photography, but it was like, how do I shape light, craft light, give di give dimension? And that was what, that that's how I sort of developed my style. So a lot of what you see that I shoot where athletes are outside or something, mm -hmm. and it's very dramatically lit, it all stemmed from going back to that project and sculpting light. Man, why, why is light so important in photography? Oh, you can't take a photograph if you don't have light. So that's why. True. <laughs> um, to me, to me, craft. it's, it's interest. It, I'm, I'm painting, I'm painting interest with light. I'm giving my subject to mention hmm. and I have control over it. Um, so that's what I enjoy the most. And a lot of times the first thing, if you tell somebody what you do for a living and I say, I'm a photographer, Guess what the first question they ask me is? What camera do you use? No, no, no. Oh. What, no, what, what subject matter do I shoot? Oh, okay. Which is weddings. Oh, you shoot weddings? Like, no, I don't shoot weddings. Like, and mm. I never, and that's because I'm not in control of the, the situation. I can't sense. control anything. It's all reactive. And yeah. that's, that's an art in and of itself. But I specifically knew when I started doing this, it was all, I just wanted to do lit portraiture and I, and I'm a huge sports nerd. Like I'm, I was a jock growing up. I love playing sports. So like my subject matter, I knew I wanted to just focus on like directing people, lighting people and figuring out a way to sort of start working with athletes. So how do you prepare for an athlete? So 
I guess what I mean, really what I'm pursuing in the question is, you probably have never met Patrick Mahomes when you're going to shoot with him. Are you preparing for him in what you think he is? Or are you going to get to the shoot and sit down with him for 10 minutes and try and figure out how to light him to capture truly like who he is? Um, that's a good question. So the, I mean, a lot of times I kind of know what athlete I'm getting. So I sort of, I, I mean, I, I know who they are. Yeah. Um, I'll go read a bio on them. I'll study up a little bit. Um, but as far as how I'm going to light them, I sort of, it sort of depends on the create, if it's an ad, if it's an advertisement or if it's editorial that comes first hmm. and that will help me to de depict because in the ad world, I'm usually being a given a creative brief or a style. Like this is the look we're going for and you're a master at what you do. So we're hiring you to execute it this way. And I get to put a little bit of spin on that or flavor, but for the most part, I'm being given direction from an ad agency if I'm shooting like a campaign for Nike. Um, and there are times where I'll go into a meeting and they'll ask me what I like or what I'll do and we'll have that discussion. Um, editorial, so if I'm shooting a story, that's where I get more creative freedom. Hmm. Um, I get more choice and more say in what I do, which I love. Um, and so I kind of have an idea sometimes about the size of the athlete are they super muscular? Are they not? Is it, you know, taller quarterback? Is it a shorter basketball guard? So I, I take some of that into consideration, but as far as, um, working with them, the one thing that I try not to do is talk to them about sports. Hmm. I don't want to, I, I don't get starstruck and I don't ever want to come off as a fanboy. I want to show more interest and be more engaged about their personal life. And because a lot of times when you meet with them, it's like, it's a job, even the photo shoots, a job for them and they don't want to be there. So mm -hmm. a perfect example is, um, I had photographed, uh, Gordon Hayward who, when he was with the Boston Celtics, mm -hmm. um, and I had him for a little bit of extra time because some of the other players were running late to the shoot. So we were just sitting there talking and I knew who was huge into video games and I knew he had, I knew he had had like three daughters and had one recently. So like all of our conversation was about like video games and his kids. I didn't ask him one single thing about basketball or talk about how he almost hit the game winning shot in the NCAA championship when he had played for Butler. And so yeah. like, you know, he hears that all the time from fans and people. So I try to keep it. I just try to be a good person and not make them feel comfortable. If I can make them feel comfortable, and we can build a rapport and I can get them to laugh a little bit. Like when they get in front of the camera, they're a lot more comfortable. Totally. Um, and we can kind of go from there. So it was a long winded answer to your question. Oh, it's, it's fantastic. Cause I often wonder, is there a, you know, a specific icebreaker question that you can dive into, but I think you just answered that you have to know about the person. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of have to know. I, it's, it's hard for me to go. I couldn't go into a shoot and not know anything about the person. Then I would look foolish. Yeah. Like, but you have to do it creatively. Like, um, you know, I don't go in so they know that I studied about them, but like just a few little tidbits of information always helps. Yeah. So yeah. You want to yeah. take them somewhere naturally that they're yeah. interested in. Yeah. So hmm. as far as getting to ESPN, Again, I'm kind of coming back there because I'm so curious. Like, I love to hear the journey of. It's a it's an interesting story, actually. Let's 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 go into it. What, okay. How did you go from a self portrait to shooting for ESPN in two years? So, um, back in 2011, I I did that 365 project I was talking about, which I didn't complete. I got like, I got over halfway through it, and I started to realize that. Um, I started to take more and more of an interest in the photography itself. Um, and then I felt like I was forcing myself every day to create something. And it was more because I started to develop a following socially, hmm. um, where I was shooting more for like other people just to get it done. Um, and I realized I wanted to start focusing more on creating like a really good, a really good portrait or a photo. So I, I wanted to spend more time focusing on finding somebody, learning about them, establishing a look or an idea, 
and storyboarding it a little bit more. So um, I would say like 200, we'll just call it 200 photos into it. I sort of just gave up on that because I, I had accomplished what I wanted to like, which was to learn light and photography. So in 200 days, I felt very comfortable with like, okay, I don't need to complete this project. I need to focus on how can I take better photos, not just getting it done for the sake of a project. Absolutely. Um, and then in 2012, the next year I got my first, um, just from, if I circle back around uh, to the business side of it, when I decided I wanted to start trying to figure out how to, how do I monetize this or make money or it just be like a side hustle. So just using my skill set that I had already have, I custom built my own website. I made my own logo. Um, and then I just started kind of marketing myself to some magazines and such. And then I got on board with, um, it's not an agency or representation, but it's a, it's a curated network of professional photographers. And th this company was doing portfolio reviews and I'd sent my website in for a portfolio review and then they contacted me and said, hey, we want to list you as a photographer through our network, which I was shocked. And once I did that, the phone started ringing be, um, and I started getting some assignments. So my first assignment I got was for Flight Journal magazine. I had to shoot a NASA scientist cool. in Destin um, and we went to do the shoot. I brought my younger brother with me as like my assistant to help set up lights and such. And then when that story came out and I saw, I got, it was like middle of the magazine, it was like a double truck spread. So it was like one big photo across two pages and it said photograph by Matthew Coughlin. I was like, that was the coolest feeling in the world. Yeah. That was when I was like, okay, how do I figure out how to do this more? And so I did a few more assignments in 2012. Uh, my youngest daughter was born that year. So it was super scary. I was still nervous about trying to pursue photography. And so in January, 2013, I told my wife, I said, I'm going to shoot for ESPN, the magazine this year. And she was like, okay. And, and that was a goal. Cause you love sports. That was a goal because I love sports and that well, going back to college. Okay. So my background was video. I was a video editor and I shot some video. My, when I was in college, I wanted to work for ESPN as a video editor doing like hi editing highlights and yeah. motion graphics packages and all that. Gotcha. And when we, I went to school in Orlando and when we moved back to Pensacola, when we found out we're having our first child, I took the job at the law firm cause it was the only thing I could find in the area. And it, again, it was very safe. Hmm. It was a paycheck. So yeah. it was like, I sort of had these big creative ambitions when I was in college and then I settled into a nine to five job for like nine years. And so when I circled back around to figure out, it's like, oh yeah, I used to be creative, enjoy doing things. <laughs> yeah. That ambition to, to get to that level of ESPN came back. And I was like, I got to figure out a way to do this. So I did a ton of research to figure out how, how do you get, you know, n never doing this before, not being taught. How do you market yourself? How do people, how do they find you? You know, they're, they're not just, they're not going to come knock on my door. Yeah. Like they don't know I exist. So you got to put yourself out there. And so I had, you know, I had read that you have to send physical mailers to them probably quarterly for a year, monthly send an email out with some fresh work. And maybe in a year you might get a response. Who are you, who are you sending these things to? What were the, what are the, what are your recommendations and what were the recommendations? So these are the, these were the recommendations that I had researched and found out was like reach out, send them prints um and then email monthly just get your work in front of them and so i would go into like barnes and noble and i would pull the magazine off the shelves and i and and i would look in the magazine to see who you know i had to figure out i was like who hires the photographer at the magazine and oh, right. editorial that person's called a photo editor they're responsible for find it finding a photographer and giving them the assignment and the direction so, um, the top editor at the time, her name was Stephanie weed and I through like LinkedIn or somewhere, I was able to find her email address, um, just like sleuthing the internet. And so I sent an email out and I was, you know, just said, Hey, I'm an aspiring photographer. I'm new. Um, and that, so this was January. So the senior bowl takes place in Mobile, Alabama. And at the time the super bowl was being held in new Orleans. 
So I sort of use that as my angle for like location purposes. I was just like, Hey, I'm in, you know, Pensacola. I'm super close to mobile. The senior bowl's happening. And then, um, I also had mentioned that, you know, if the super bowl, so I was like, if there's anything you need, like, I would love to be able to cover an assignment for you. So it was like email one went out. I yeah. was like, okay, it's going to take a year to hear back. And so that night, my wife and I sat down, we were going to watch a movie and I just happened to look at my phone and saw that I, I got an email response. And she had basically responded and said, I love your work. Um, I'm actually currently looking for a photographer in Tuscaloosa right now to shoot an assignment next week. Are you available? Sweet. And I was like, what, like same day? Like I sent one email <laughs> and it was a matter of, because I had, I had, like I said, going back to just building everything up and putting all the pieces in place. And this is really before like Squarespace existed and all these templated sites. I mean, I, I literally hand coded and custom built my own website. So my portfolio was up. Yep. I took like my best 40 pictures from that project. Um, and she was under the assumption that I was like a professional shooter. Hey, um, you, yeah, you are. Cause I, I mean, I did some work <laughs> yeah. with some athletes and yeah. I posted some mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. And so that was my first assignment with ESPN, the magazine, the fact that it happened like that, I was like, okay, this was like, I've got to be able to, if, if they're going to respond in the same day and give me an assignment, I've got to be able to get work from other places too. So that was the mm. moment in which I realized that I could do it. So that was the belief moment. Yeah. That was the aha moment. Like I got to pursue this. So, so you said you're shooting other athletes who, who had you shot up into that point? So when I say I'm, we're just talking like local kids in the area, like, so like just like a high school sports, yeah, high school sports kid. Like I, yeah. I, w I would know a teacher or I would know somebody in the community and I was like, Hey, can you put me in contact with this football player? I'd love to shoot a portrait of him and we'd get it set up. So I was shooting like some football players and lacrosse players and a few other things. And I, and so my objective, what I, so part of, how I sort of built my portfolio was I would tell the parents of the kid, I was like, Hey, I don't, don't pay me for this photo shoot. I don't want anything. Actually, I, I want to treat this like it's under armor, go to Dick's sporting goods, buy three outfits that are all under armor. And I'm going to shoot this like it's an ad. And so I was shooting like spec stuff for me, giving myself challenges and assignments. And so I built up, a portfolio that had all these different looks with different brands that were branded. Um, man, and it looks, and I shot it and it all looked polished and there's no questions asked when, I mean, if somebody contacted me, it wasn't like, was this a shoot for this company or not? It was just, no, it looked like it belonged in a professional portfolio. So you're so, aiming towards what you want to be known for. You're aiming towards as if you're already doing it. Yeah. So I, I didn't want to shoot, I didn't want to shoot bait. That sounds terrible. I didn't want to shoot babies. Nobody wants to shoot babies. I didn't want to photograph children, families, weddings, pets, food, architect. Like I was hyper focused on people with, um, yeah, with it, it, but mainly athletes. So you would say that, that breadth is not as important as depth. If you're trying to become a, a professional photographer yeah. and you know what you want. Yes. And what I tell people all the time is you have to show what you want to get hired for. Hmm. If I was, if I had accepted every little gig that came down through a Facebook message about photographing somebody's child or a wedding, or, you know, I always referred that stuff to somebody I knew, but like, if that was my portfolio and ESPN went to my website and saw that, why would they hire me? Absolutely. I'm not, I mean, it's such a mix, uh, such a mix of work. Yeah. And I think what a lot of pe the trap, a lot of young people fall into when they're building their body of work is they just want to get hired. Hmm. So it's like, well, if I show that I could shoot a wedding, if I show that I can photograph food, if I show that I can photograph a family, if I show that I can also photograph corporate headshots and do this. Okay. Well, it's like, well, you can do all of those things and you can say yes to any of those jobs that come in. But if I solely focus on shooting very authentic portraits of editorial portraits of people, and I'm really good at photographing athletes, like that's what I want to get hired for. That's the only thing I'm going to show. The key is knowing what you want. 
Yes, absolutely. And a lot of people don't. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So developing your style, were you looking to get in front of ESPN because of what you saw they shot? Or were you getting in front of them with how you thought things needed to be shot? I think to answer that question, it circles back around it. I wanted to prove to myself that I belonged and that I was capable of getting to that level uh, because aspirationally, that's what I wanted to do out of college. I wanted to, I, I don't know if you'd call it credibility. I just wanted to prove that I could do it at the highest level. And to me at that time, like ESPN from an editorial perspective was like, it didn't get any higher than that. That was like my dream client that I wanted to work for. And if I could do that, I could do anything. It was just proof to you. Yes. Got it. With the, uh, thinking about this, you just said, you know, if you go wide, you're, you're basically vanilla to everybody. You're, you don't have any sort of draw. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question to you, and I don't mean this offensively, I really want to know your answer on this. So in the age of the Google Pixel, the iPhone, the Samsung S23, what sets apart great photography from, uh, from Apple and Google saying that their phones take amazing pictures? What sets apart a professional like yourself? Consistency. Okay. Consistency. I, I do what I do consistently. Um, I have a style and a look and I do the job and I nail it every time and you can see it through my body of work. And that sounds so cocky to say. Um, and anybody who knows me knows that I'm not that way, but if I'm being dead honest, yeah. it's the fact that I can perform every job when I go out and do it. Um, and I could do it with any piece of equipment that you give me. It does not, the, the technology doesn't matter. So you could use the iPhone. Yeah. If you, if you said, if you, if I, if it was all I had, I would, I would try to create something amazing and I would figure out a way to do it. Your work is amazing, right? Thank you. You have incredible work. There's a lot of people who have great work. Why are they not working for ESPN? Um, that comes down to personal drive, I think, and knowing what you want and focusing on how you go achieve that. I, again, I'm working at the highest level that I could possibly work based on what I want to do. If we talk about portraiture, working in the advertising world and editorial world, I have shot it for sports. I've shot for the, the biggest magazines um, and I shoot campaigns for the biggest brands in the world yeah. with the most famous athletes in the world and I do it consistently. Um, and it's because I believe that I can do it. I'm, I focus on my craft. Um, I'm a good person. I'm easy to get. I, and that sounds so funny, but like, I'm very, I'm very down to earth. I don't have an ego at all. So when I said the thing about being cocky earlier, that something sounding cocky, cause that's, I don't talk like that. I don't communicate like that. But like, if you're just trying to drill me down in my mind, I know what I'm capable of. Um, and it's a matter of, I mean, a lot of my work too has grown from, from networking and communication and consistently doing great work for one client and then getting a referral and then bigger ad agencies recognizing a campaign that I shot and saying, well, we want that guy to shoot our campaign. What do you think it is? Again, like I'm just, I love this conversation because it's like, okay, what is it that gets you into that flywheel? What do you think it is that they, that they see the work? Do they hear their buddy say, Hey, we worked with Matt. Not only does he shoot great work, but gosh, he was easy to work with. Like, is that usually like the, yes. the lighter, the lighter fluid? It is, fluid? yes, it is. Um, and I work with um, sort of my, uh, I mean, I call her my producer and she does, you know, marketing and stuff for me. Um, her name's Stephanie Borjan. And, you know, the biggest thing 
she handles most of the communication with the clients on the backside. Um, but the biggest thing that we get is that I'm easy to work with. Yeah. I'm very uh, collaborative on set. Um, I don't mind hearing from the agency people or the, you know, um, or even the talent that I'm working with. Like I, I want to one, you're paying me to do a job. So I want to execute it and do the best that I can. It's your creative. You have a say in it. So let's work together. We have this athlete that's involved. How do they want to look? So I do a really good job of like making sure everybody feels good on set. And I don't have all of the best ideas, but I'm the best at taking all of that and making it come to life. So knowing your skill set and what you're yes. good at is bringing together all the pieces. Yes. Capturing that idea in that moment. Absolutely. Yeah. Are you at the top of your game? I am at the highest level that I can be at. I am at the top of my game, but I can still go so much higher. And I'm, I'm the obstacle that I have to overcome. And I, I limit my own capabilities. Um, there's nobody else other than me that dictates where I can go or how high I can go. Um, I've done some incredible things in my career that I have to pinch myself and remind myself um, that I've gotten to do when looking back to like going back to working for the law firm yeah. again 10 years ago. Yeah. I've done things in the span of a few years that I feel like other people, if they only if they accomplished a few of those things in their entire career would feel fulfilled. Um, and so a lot of times I'm like, I don't know how much higher up or where I go from here, but it's the consistency of being hired again um, from the same clients, from new clients. Uh, that drives me, but it, I'm, at, I'm doing things at the highest level that can be done, but I can do more. Is it important for you to be looking up to certain photographers, or mm. is it important for you to just be thinking out, outside of your own box? Thinking outside of your own box, if I focus too much on a certain photographer or another photographer, um, I don't know. I feel like you'll start to emulate that person or I just don't feel like you should sit there and compare yourself to somebody else. Um, I don't think that's a healthy way to do it. I think you'd have to focus on what your own goals are um, and see if you can achieve those and go that route. I, I don't know. I don't I don't find inspiration from other photographers or anything like that. Um, you know, I don't go searching for, for inspiration. I'll get, um, an assignment and just try to figure out how I want, you know, at the time I don't go too, I don't go too deep into what I'm, what I'm doing. It's when something comes down the pipe, I'll figure it out when it comes in. And then I'll go do that. But I'm not trying to emulate anything that's already been done. Yeah. I have my lighting style and I'm always trying to push myself to do it a little bit differently because I don't want to get stuck and comfortable because I feel like if I settle into a certain look in five years, um, everything's going to look the same. So I'm constantly trying to push myself and challenge myself to do things a little bit differently. Do you test out new ideas? on a shoot or you have a, a practice ground where you're playing with these ideas? Uh, well both, but that's why the studio exists. Gotcha. So you come in here and test, uh, test out ideas. I can do whatever I want in here. Nice. So, so, okay. Since you brought it up, we're here at Monarch studio. Mm -hmm. What is it about this place that gives you that sort of creative freedom? What did you do here? Well, this started, so Monarch studio started, um, in the wake of the pandemic when I thought my career was over. Um, was it seemingly over? You weren't getting any clients or like, what was Oh, happening? it was the scariest thing in my life. Okay. Yeah. I was on the heels of 2019, um, was probably some of the biggest work I had ever shot. Um, and the opportunities that I had that year were like, in, were ridiculously amazing. And I went from, uh, I, the big thing that happened that year is I, I went to Greece to photograph Giannis for a collaboration with Nike and slam magazine for the cover of kicks for his first shoe release. And then when I returned from that trip, 
I got hired to shoot Oakley's first NFL campaign for collaboration for being the brand sponsor for visors for Oakley. So that was where my first shoot with Patrick Mahomes came in. Wow. Um, and I did a lot of other things that year. And then 2020, I set, um, I, I set some goals and sort of circling back around to the ESPN thing that we had talked about. And I don't know if you could say it, manifesting it or whatever, uh, making it happen. I had told, I told my wife again that I wanted to shoot in 2020. I wanted to shoot um, a campaign, whether it's editorial or, or advertising. I want to shoot. I, I'm from Boston originally. I grew up there as a kid. Okay. It's like I want to shoot something with a pro Boston athlete, whether it's football, baseball, hockey, whatever. It's like my goal was I wanted to shoot anything with any of uh, any athlete from one of my favorite teams. Cool. And I wanted to shoot a baseball campaign because I hadn't done much baseball work. I'd done a ton of football work and a ton of basketball work, but I has I hadn't really shot anything baseball. Um, so at the end of 2019, you know, we had that discussion and we were coming back from, we went and visited some of her family for Christmas and it was like December 29th. I'm driving back home and the phone rings and it's slam magazine. Um, and they're like, hey, Matt, can you go to Boston on January 1st to shoot the Celtics for the cover of the magazine? And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Nice. I was like, okay, well, you know, goal, goal one, was check. too fast, Slam. <laughs> yeah, I was like, it was literally, I flew to Boston on January 1st. Oh, my word. That's literally, fantastic. yeah. Um, oh. And then when I got back from that trip, uh, I had established a really good relationship with an ad agency or a production agency out of Los Angeles called Step Studios, okay. and they were consistently hiring me to shoot Oakley campaigns. Nice. Um, and when I got back from that trip, they called me and said, "Hey, we want to, you know, we want you out in Los Angeles to photograph Shohei Itani, um, the Japanese pitcher uh, okay. who also bats, who won the uh, the MVP." So I was like, "Okay," so I did that. Um, and when I was flying back from that is when I started to notice everybody wearing masks in Los Angeles and on the airplane. And it, it was the eeriest feeling. What was this January? So this was, this was that. So I did that in February. Okay. And then when I got back from that trip was when everything started to go dark. You're like what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> and then, um, and then when the lockdown happened, it's like, wow, like, you know, not ha I mean, I work for myself. So not having the comfort of an employer and a consistent paycheck or a salary. It's like, if I'm not taking pictures, no. I'm not making money. Yeah. And then the phone just stops ringing because we can't, we can't go travel. anywhere. We can't, can't travel. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and then when they called me to basically say like, Hey Matt, uh, for the next NFL campaign, they had to hire local photographers in every city. But they said, if that photographer get, can you hold these dates? If the photographer gets COVID, we're going to fly you out. And I was like, okay. Why not just fly me out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I understood at the time <laughs> know, with know, everything going on, but it was <laughs> like, man, that stings. Like, yeah. I, like, that was when I realized, like, I can't work at the level I was doing it. Like, hmm. I can't travel. I can't do these things um, and nothing was going on. So I was like, I might have to like reinvent myself. That's, was um, that a good, it, was that a good thing? Well, looking back it was. Okay. Um, and that's sort of where the studio came into play because I was like, I might have to start shooting corporate headshots. I might have to start, you know, just work. I, because I went from traveling the country or traveling to, you know, Europe and places to shoot things. I was like, I might have to start working in my own backyard yeah, and build things back up. I didn't know what to do. So um, that's sort of how this came to fruition was I needed a place to shoot for myself, one. And then two was like, I didn't know what else I was going to do. I didn't know if I was going to get the clients back that I had had. And so that, yeah, that was scary. That was like really dark for me. Have you developed any kind of new businesses on the tail end of that uh, just as like, I don't know, precautionary measure or you still hyper-focused on, on being on to shoot now that we're back out of that? 
Um, we started to take on more, uh, at the time, more corporate stuff. Um, and doing, I did a lot of headshots during that time. Um, did a lot of shoots outside where I could, you know, go and photograph, you know, one person at a time while other people waited inside and everybody was masked up and it was just doing anything I could to scrape by. Yeah. Um, and so the studio came to fruition, uh, which when we built it, um, it, re it really kicked off in 2021. Um, it took, I mean, this place was a dump when we got into it. Yeah. Um, it took a while to get it up and running, but it started out being rented out by a lot of other creatives in the community to come in. There's been a ton of music videos shot here. Cool. Um, uh, people rent it for photos all the time. We've had um, Calliope Films has rented it a good bit to shoot stuff for like A&E Network. Cool. Like true murder crime mystery shows in here and stuff. Really? Yeah. So it's, Crazy. yeah, it's, it's been used a, a lot. So from a business perspective, it was another way to have revenue come in, um, for the space to be used by others in the community, which, which has been great. Um, yeah. and I have formed a couple of relationships now with a grip and rental company who keeps their gear here and rents it out. Um, and we have other creatives who rent offices. So yeah. Um, so I didn't really intend for it to go this way, but it just sort of organically happened. Um, and so, yeah, I think it was a good thing that came out of it. So when this opened and the world started to come back to life a little bit, yeah. I started to work again, um, traveling. Yeah. So I ended up being able to do this and have it sort of run itself, which is great. Um, so yeah, I think it was a benefit. So it's like the space is paying for itself and making money yes. as an extra income source, yes. which is awesome. Yes. Okay. Curious. First photo you took for ESPN. If you don't mind, how much did you charge? So when you get into editorial photography, um, that pricing structure is pretty much set. Hmm. Um, no matter how long you've yeah, been in the game? Yeah. So no matter how long you've been, well, I guess... It, it has to, it's, it's space and size in the magazine. Okay. So it, it, it's one, the, the size of the publication. So on the nat, on a national scale, you know, ESPN's big and their, their reach was huge. Um, and so you got to think like, if you're shooting a cover, are you shooting is, and then is the story in the magazine going to have multiple pages, a mm. double truck or whatever, multiple photos. Yeah. Multiple photos. Story. So you're getting paid for how many photographs are used, where they're being used in the site. So they have, they basically have a pricing structure they present to you. And that's pretty much how the, the editorial world works. Now, what I've learned from going back to that is there's some room for negotiation. You can, but we're talking in the hundreds of dollars at, wow. at for editorial back then um advertising is a whole different animal okay so i want to say that like my my day rate then i got photographed for espn to shoot one photo that was going to be used in the fan section of the magazine um and so it was like a half a page okay so for me that was human at the time that was like humongous yeah, like yeah. it didn't matter like you didn't I, really concern about the the, the way you're getting paid yeah. it was like that you were doing it yes okay um so i want to say that my rate for that was like six hundred dollars plus all travel expenses okay um and that was it and then at the end of the year um i got hired by espn the magazine again to shoot um, uh, two Auburn football players. And that was the year that Auburn went to the national championship and they had that, uh, the kick six punt return when they beat Alabama and they had a crazy ending to a game against Georgia. So they hired me to shoot the two football players who were like the heroes in those games. Gotcha. Now that was a lot different. I want to say I got paid like $2,000 for the day. Yeah. Uh, one of them was a potential cover and then the way they used them in the magazine. So I went from like $600 to $2,000. Um, and now we're doing, now I do jobs for a major sports brand with a budget. It could like, we consistently do projects around the $50,000 range for that going out, shooting that specific athlete for that time period. Yeah. Or uh, like, we'll, I'll shoot for a sports brand with a model in a studio and 
it's, you know, one day, six hours, $50,000 budget. Um, and you know, there's expenses involved in that. I'm, I'm not yeah. putting that in my pocket, Yeah. but that's the scope or range of where it started to what we're do- what I'm doing now. So I think for, for a new photographer getting into it, $2,000 would be incredible, but $50,000 is like unbelievable. Is it the fact, obviously skill, mm-hmm. uh, time, mm-hmm. where, where is that value? How, sorry, better question. How do you present yourself of someone being worth that value? So I'm responsible for that budget. Like I have to be able to, one, I know what my rates are. Um, and I have to responsibly spend that money to execute that job. Um, and I have to establish trust with that client to know that they're going to give me that money. They're going to get their results and what they need. Um, and they're going to be able to use the images for the length of time that we agree to have them licensed. Um, but it's the, it's when you look at my body of work and I'm consistently performing for other brands and you see the recognition of the athletes that I work with, I would hope and think that it's a no brainer that you're going to be able to work with me and you're going to get the results that you're looking for or hoping for. Yeah. So the quality of the work, but just as much know, yeah. like, and trust Matt. Exactly. And it's all communication on the front end and the back end too in pre-production and keeping them in the loop on how we're going to perform this job, hmm. how we're going to execute the job, where the money's going, how it's being spent. Um, and then communication on the backside of making sure the deliverables are met on time. Um, we always over deliver. Uh, there's always, you know, I always bring back additional assets or I will shoot extra things that usually end up will that will be bought or licensed additionally. Um, I present a lot of my clients with animations or GIF options to have. Cool. So it's a matter of like, I, I maximize my time in the space that we have. And I always shoot what's asked. And then with the additional time that we have, I go far above and beyond and over deliver to give them more options to work with. So are you bringing like a second shooter to do like, video or like how are you catching how are you getting more is it just literally you are doing more personally or are you bringing in like other people in that budget to like help no it's me doing more okay yeah it's knowing what i can accomplish in the time being strategic staying on schedule um and just recognizing what i see or can be done um and I'm always working when I'm on set and I, I don't, I recognize when we have lunch breaks or we have, we have breaks where everybody's got to stop and what, like I, my mind is always going mm. and I have to be reminded to eat or do something. Cause I want to keep, I see things and I don't yeah. want, I don't like downtime. I don't like any of that. Uh, and I just push myself to try to get as much as we can and make sure. Um, and again, circling back around to what I said earlier about being collaborative, mm. um, you know, we've got monitors on set everywhere. The client sees things. So I'm constantly talking with somebody about minute details that we see or things that we want to change, or I have this idea. And so it's, it's all communication and everything on, on set, but it's just, it's again, it circles back around to name recognition for me. Uh, the consistency that you see in my port- my portfolio um, and that other people can, you know, tell their friends or clients in the industry that, you know, we produce, I get the job done and I'm, I have the big, the biggest thing that we always hear is uh, the, the ego part is I don't carry an ego. And I think there's a big stigma with like high level professional photographers. Mm. Um, I, it's funny because I can tell when somebody approaches me on set, like they always do it with caution. Like interesting. Yeah. And so it's there's that much of a reputation. Yes. For photographers. Yes, absolutely. It's so funny to me because I can, t- I can see it in the person's eyes or their approach where it's like, uh, excuse me. They're very quiet. Sir I'm, Matt. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> please don't do that, please. Um, and then it's you. And then we always hear at the end of a shoot from like, the hair and makeup stylist or the wardrobe stylist or this was like, Oh my gosh, you were so easy to work with. Cool. And so, and like, to me, that's the biggest thing is like, there's so many people involved now 
that helped me accomplish the, the goal and the job. Like, you know, we're, I'm headed up next week. We're shooting a, a campaign for Nike in Brooklyn cool. and we've got a crew of people that we always hire up in that area. And it takes a team of people to do, to do this. It's not just me walking in with a camera and one assistant. It's like a, it, it takes a village to do a bigger ad production. Is it because of the amount of gear that comes in? Uh, it, it's gear and it's, it's uh, proficiency and um, having the systems built out and knowing the flow of how we're going to do the project. Um, but yeah, between, I mean, wardrobes, wardrobe is huge. Hair and makeup has to be on point. Um, and then so we have hiring those things. Yes. Then. So when I talk about our budget, th those are people. <clears throat> so mm. we have to make decisions. We have to hire people. We have to bring in the right crew and we have to make sure they gel. On, everybody gels on set because wow. if I'm not going to have an ego, nobody else is going to have an ego. That's true. Um, and so we want to make sure that my client feels super comfortable with everybody involved. Dang. So that's what I'm talking about. It's like, we can manage a budget and manage a project and bring in all the right people. So basically a VP of marketing could be like, I know I'm going to hire Matt because I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to get a great result. All exactly. I got to do is write the check. Exactly. Nice. Yes. Okay. You brought up the photography thing. You don't have to name names. Worst, worst photographer you've ever worked with. What, what happened? Worst photographer I've yeah, ever worked? Like, have you ever like been like they've hired two photographers and this guy was no. just throwing knives? No, something. no, no, no. I've <laughs> never been on set with another Okay. another photographer um so are you asking me for a horror story yeah um yeah i i two horror stories okay uh one so we had so it, here in this studio one of the first projects that i shot was a was a nike campaign a nike running campaign okay and it was my second job with this agency out of kentucky called built and um we had we had three, four models fly in from different parts of the country. And um, it was the first time I had ever, I asked the client when we were shooting, I was like, have you ever fired a model? And he was, he laughed and he looked at me. He's like, no, have you? And I was like, no, but we were both like, this might be a first for both of us. Um, like on the spot, fire them. Yeah. Which sounds terrible. <laughs> However, I was able to dig deep and like direct and get what we needed out of this person. But it was a, it was a experience like no other. It was funny looking back on it, but it was like the model was just cringy and it was, it wasn't, he didn't represent Nike like the way that the brand wanted to be represented. Gotcha. And it just took a lot of directing and, um, I don't know how he slipped through the cracks in the um, in the casting process, but it was just yeah, me and the client both looking at each other and trying to figure out a way to make it work. Is but, this a, is this a well, uh, it camera was, moment? No, no, that's exactly that's exactly what we both said was like, dude, is somebody filming this right now? <laughs> um, so that was um, that was quite an experience, and then. Um, I was just shooting a, a campaign uh, in Los Angeles and we had a pro athlete. I, I don't want to name names. Totally understand. But we had a pro athlete show up an hour late. Um, and when he rolled onto the set, it was like the worst attitude I had ever seen. Um, didn't take direction, acted like he didn't want to be there, was a jerk. Um, and same thing. I looked at look, the client and I both had a minute where we were like, this is the worst photo shoot either of us had ever had, you know, and they work with other photographers and stuff. And, and I've worked with a, a ton of athletes, but yeah. we were both connected instantly and knew. And, um, if my buddy sees this, he'll, he'll know exactly <laughs> which athlete I'm talking about. Yeah. Both knew like, this is a train wreck. However, it turned around quickly when um, there were some kids who snuck onto the set um, of the shoot. Really? We were outside at a football field. Okay. They snuck on set. So the athlete, he was nice enough. He went over and talked with every single kid. He signed autographs. And then when he came back to us, he asked if he could connect his phone to like the Bluetooth speaker and played some music. And then he turned around and it ended up being a great shoot 
Hmm. It really, it, it really ended up being like really good. Um, I'll tell you who it is after the, after we finish. Yeah. Um, but in that moment I was scared. I was like, I don't know what these images are going to look like. So did that teach you something about how to approach somebody who comes in with a poor, poor spirit as it were? Um, a little bit because I don't feel like it was, that's one of the times where it was like, I don't feel like I pulled it out. I'm super thankful those kids snuck onto the football field. Yeah. It's crazy that that, that was around. the difference maker. I think, mm. um, I, I like to think in my mind, the guy was out late partying, slept in, was hung over. I, you know, I don't know. It yeah. was because his reputation is that he's a great person he has a huge social following. He's very active on social. His personality is huge. And then like when we met, when he rolled up. And so I didn't have a, I didn't have a chance. I didn't have a single word or conversation. Got he was it. so late. We just had to start. Yeah. So it was like he had never met me. We didn't say a word to each other. I just had to just start giving direction. Oh, so he God. walks up and he's just being told what to do. So yeah. it, it just had a bad start. That makes sense. So, um, so yeah, I guess I learned a lot, but at the same time, I was like, if those kids didn't show up, I don't know how that would have ended up. I feel confident that I would have gotten it to where it needed to be and we would have gotten the results. But at the same time, I got lucky that those kids snuck onto the football field. So and ch to potentially ruin the shoot, but save the shoot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I wouldn't say they, they weren't like. They were, I don't know if they would have ruined the shoot, but they weren't, it was supposed to be a close set. Yeah. So best experience you've ever had. Best experience I've ever had. Um, I have a lot of them, man. I, I, again, I have to pinch myself all the time. I, I never would have in my wildest dreams imagined I would have done the things that I've done. Um, I, I grew up as a kid. I, I never thought of myself as like creative. I wasn't artistic when I was young. I didn't like draw or paint or hmm. I, I didn't grow up with a camera in my hand as a photographer. Like I said, I was a, I was a jock, but I grew up. It's funny to think back. I grew up with posters all over my wall of Michael Jordan, Larry Bird, Joe Montana, like all these famous athletes. So I was surrounded by pictures of athletes hmm. and my walls were like covered. You couldn't see the wall. And so I always look back at like that, like, was I inspired somehow by that? And I didn't realize that, you know, I don't know. Um, and and you, when you met me, I'm, I'm, I'm a small person. I'm not big. So, um, well, I love I, your Instagram cover photo. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to be a pro athlete when I was a kid, but that didn't pan out. But what I like to think is I found a way to get into that world. Hmm. is I work at the highest level that you can work at with the biggest athletes that you can work at. I get to go into stadiums and arenas. Uh, we shot, you know, I just took over uh, Cameron Indoor Stadium for Duke men's basketball and did a whole entire photo shoot on there. I get these athletes. I tell them what they do and they have to listen to me. <laughs> so like I have to pinch myself. Like yeah. I, I do like I get paid to do that. That's cr that is freaking Incredible. crazy. Yeah. Um, and I just shot a project in Orlando with an NBA player and we went to the game the night before and I see thousands of people wearing this dude's Jersey. And I have to tell myself, I'm like, any one of them would give their left arm to like, just take a picture with that person or have him sign an autograph. And I'm like, tomorrow I get to meet this dude, hang out with him for four hours and photograph him. Yeah. And get paid to do it and, and get paid to do it. <laughs> And that's it's my, incredible. like, it's crazy. Like I, I, I can be honest. Like it is, what I do is crazy and I'm beyond grateful. Yeah. And I kind of know how it happened, but at the same time, I'm like, how did this happen to me? Um, but I think, um, going to Greece, uh, I'd mentioned back in 2019, I went to Greece and I photographed Giannis, um, for his first shoe release, which was in, insane. And then when I came back from that trip, um, I got the call for that assignment on Father's Day. I was out with my kids and my father-in-law that day when the phone rang and I got that assignment. So that was like a really cool memory to have. And then when I came back from that shoot, I was having lunch with my dad that week. 
um, to tell him about the trip. And then the phone rang when I was at lunch with my dad, when I got the call to do the NFL campaign for Oakley with Patrick Mahomes, Derwin James and Juju Smith Schuster. And I was like, what in the world? And that was like the NBA MVP and then the NFL MVP, like back to back. Um, so from like an experience perspective, that week was just crazy. And again, just being a sports fan and, and, and sitting there with my dad was like, like dad, I just got a call to, I just got back from photographing from Greece with Giannis. And now I got to go photograph Patrick Mahomes. And like, that was, that's like a memory that will just always be, I'll be forever grateful. Um, but I think probably one of the, one other memory favorite moment, um, when I was really starting to work my way up, yeah. um, was I, I had this idea, um, for a photograph I wanted to shoot with Bubba Watson, knowing that he is from here. I yeah. was like, I was like, at some point I'm going to have to photograph this guy. I was like, it's, a, I just felt like it was inevitable. Cool, cool. I was like, it's going to happen. And when it does, I had this vision of, I wanted to put golf balls all around him and have it look like he was doing a snow angel in golf balls. And I had that idea for like a year. And then my first assignment I got with Oakley, he was an Oakley athlete. Um, the production agency came in and we were photographing. They had a concept that they had to do, um, for their video, uh, their TV commercial they were shooting. And then I had to shoot stills in that, that campaign world. But then they were like, we need a handful of additional images or assets to use of him for other glasses and wardrobe. And they're like, what ideas do you have? And I was like, I've, I was like, I've got this idea. Um, and they were like, cool, love it. Let's do it. And I was like, okay, how do I do that? <laughs> like, I need a million golf balls. And so how many golf balls was it? Do you know? Um, I don't, I feel like we knew the number at the time it was in the thousands. Um, but it was, we shot it at Marcus point golf course okay. and the range people brought, they must've had like, it must've been 20 buckets of golf balls. Nice. And I hired a really good friend of mine who I worked with. who's like a prop stylist. And the, the night before the shoot, we went to her house and her, my best friend, her husband was like, I think he's like the same size as Bubba. And so we like laid him down on, um, studio paper. And I was like, reach your arms out, reach up here as high as you can reach down low as you can. And then we traced the, um, we traced the outline on the studio paper and then we we were like, we had her cut it out and knowing that I would only have like one hour with him on the golf course. And I had to shoot like five different setups. Oh my gosh. I this was, was like, like, just one of the ideas. Yeah. This you... is just one of the ideas. Oh my word. And then I also had her build sand castles in a bunker and we were going to have him hit golf balls off of sand castles in, in the bunker with like sand toys everywhere. So she had to go set all these things up while I was actually in here. We were shooting in here. So she's out there. You're she's in here. out on the boom, golf boom. course. Oh my word. And so she pins down the snow angel to know the shape. So all he has to do is step into it and just lay and spread out. And you guys already had, she'd already set up all the golf balls. Yes. And so he literally um, didn't make a snow angel. No, no, that would have been impossible to move. I mean, that's a lot of weight to move. <laughs> <laughs> but we pre-planned it totally, and so um, he we we are flying around on a golf cart going from this hole to that oh, hole so to fun. that, and I'm like praying that she has it set up. Yeah, and we get there, and and then they're te- so his um, his like holder or his 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 rep is like you know you guys only have 15 more minutes before Bubba's out. You're done for the day. And we had like three more shoots to do. So, Holy crap. um, we had pulled in that, that 18 foot ladder and like had it set up on the court. I, I climb up that thing as fast as I can. I think, I think I shot like six shots and I had him lay down. I was like, hands up, hands down, hands straight out. I was like, okay, get up. And so I was like, it lasted 45 seconds. No. So and prep then, was everything. Yeah. Oh and then we were God. running. He's like had to go smash these sandcastles in a bunker. And then we had a hot dog waiting for him on set for the green. So we had him like putting and eating a hot dog at the same. He, I had him doing all this stupid stuff. But <laughs> He's like, who it, is this guy? <laughs> no, but that's his personality. His okay, personality okay. is goofy. So okay, like cool. he loved it all. Awesome. And he actually stayed longer. Cool. He ended up telling his publicist. He was like, no, I'm good. I've got like 10 more minutes. I'm good. He was having fun. 
And then we had him shoot like, um, what is, is it? Po it's polo, right? Where yeah. the jockey hits the, yep. so we had him driving a golf cart and like hitting golf balls, leaning out of the golf cart as he was going. So he had a great time. It's so fun. And from that, is how my relationship started with this ad agency out of Los Angeles. Okay. They were like super impressed because they just wanted like a local photographer from the area to like just get some shots. And then they saw that I could produce and perform and then they saw the results. So from there, that's how I started shooting for Oakley more and more okay. and more. And they, and I started to travel everywhere and shoot, shoot for them and sort of for a while became like the Oakley guy. Um, but it all started from just having this crazy idea to shoot something with Bubba. And so looking back, that's probably one of my most fa favorite photographs. It's because I had that idea. I believed in it and I was able to execute it, even though it only lasted 40. Well, I took the photograph for like 45 seconds, but it took a team of people to make it happen. Absolutely. Um, that's probably one of my, favorite memories that's so funny it's like it, there's so many connecting points like it's local it's somebody you looked like it was fun so it's an exciting shoot do you do you always want to have fun on a shoot Is oh that, yeah yeah, like, yeah okay i'm not trying to like cut you off but yeah i i don't i'm i don't take myself too seriously at okay. all um i feel i study up on terrible dad jokes um and i use horrible jokes all the time to like get my talent to like laugh or relax. Genuinely laugh. Genuinely laugh. And usually they're laughing at how dumb the joke is. And then it's like the coming down from the laugh is where you get like an authentic smile. If, if you're going for a smile or a look, hmm. that's where you draw that authenticity is taking them away from something that's forced that looks like a school grade photograph totally. to like finding that, per that perfect moment with them. And to me, that's the art of being able to direct and get that look that's can that's more candid and mm -hmm. real versus a forced smile. Um, so I'm always trying to have fun on my sets. Always, music is key. Music's huge. So you find out what they like. Yeah, oh, absolutely. It. Yeah, yeah. And if, if I'm on a shoot and there's no music, it's so awkward, dude. It's so awkward. I smile hate it. Smile for me. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. It's creepy. Um, and I need that. I need that beat, or I need that energy for me because I get going. Um, and then, yeah, so like, I'm always trying to have fun on it. So a music's set. going, you're like telling a joke and in that whole exchange is when yeah. you're shooting. Yeah. It's not like, all right, come here and smile. Yeah, no, no, no. And I'll call, and I'll call an athlete out on their bullshit too. Like, okay. um, I shot for the New York jets. Um, I was hired, um, to shoot, f uh, for Nike. I was shooting the New York jets, new uniform launch a couple years ago. And I had the athlete come out and it, I think it was a running back. And I was like, Hey, make this cut. You know, I've got to, I've got to get this action of you planting your foot and we've got to get this move. And he came out and he was just like, boom, boom, boom. I was like, bro, that looks so fake. He's like, what? And I was like, come look on the monitor. I was like, you don't, I was like, this has no action. You're going through the motions. And like, I'm like coaching them and yelling at them, like as a coach yeah. and telling them it looks like shit. And they're like, okay, I got you. I got you. I got you. And then I was, and then I, you know, it was like, now you got to like scream. He was like, you really got to scream. And if you didn't do it good, I would call him out and tell him, I was they like, dude, you again. sound like a little girl, bro. Like, come on. Like you're a 245 pound man who runs people over. You don't look like it right now. So it's like, I'm honest and yeah. I try to be funny about it. And I like, I'm, I just try to be raw and be myself. Uh, but at the end of the day, like if you don't perform, like it, if I don't get it out of you, it's well, that's on, on me now. Yeah. Like if it doesn't look authentic, then my work's not authentic. Like, so. Dang. It's so crazy how like it's probably, I mean, obviously you've spent years building up the skill, but when you're on set, it's 20% skill, 80% getting the person to yeah. do the thing. Yeah. Um, is, I'm sorry. Is that correct? Yeah. There's a lot more to the light and pressing the shutter button. There's so much more than that. Yeah. That's you have to perfect that. That's like a hundred percent of it to get started. Yes. To get your, you know, to get where you want to go is you have to be able to create the images. But now it's like, well, that's a given. Like if I'm being at the level you're being hired at, like, okay, that's a given. You better do that. <laughs> you know, yeah. now it's, well, how do you get it? The, the polish, the look, the finish, 
the um, the personality, how it's how is all of that drawn out, and then running the business side of it. That's like, yeah, you you could say twenty eighty. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Once you're here, getting yeah. started, it's flipped eighty twenty. Yeah, the eighty yeah. twenty's flipped. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, that's a good analogy or a good way to put it. Yeah, you start with a skill, you end with this communication in the organization, the planning, the optimizing, how to have everybody where they're at, where they need to be, so you can shoot forty five seconds. And get the shot. Yeah. Like the bubble. You know, the bubble yeah. Awesome. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> first time, uh, the first time you met Patrick from Holmes, what happened? <laughs> um, my first shoot with Patrick Mahomes was crazy. Um, yeah, I would have, you would have thought I was photographing like the president of the United States when we did it. Um, we had to go to Arrowhead Stadium. Um, I was in Kansas city for a couple days. It was a big, I mean, it was a, it was a huge campaign. Like looking back on that was like, I don't think I realized at the time, the scale of it, like Oakley took over Times square with this launch, wow. like, like all of Times square, they had every single digital monitor for the launch of this campaign. Um, it was huge looking back on it and the stakes were nerve. I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it. The stakes were nerve wrackingly humongous. Um, and sort of how this went down was I had, I had my creative direction from Oakley. Um, we had to hang all this like red fabric and stuff up to have this sort of look behind him to add this texture and movement was like one of the styles. And then we also had to um, photograph him sort of with the field and the stadium in the background. So we had, I had two sets Okay. and I go out there on the, on our scout day. Um, and he's shooting a campaign that day for Bose headphones. Uh, he's shooting, it was, you know how like for Sunday night football, they have all the, like the pregame intro for the show and the, yep. So he had that green screen set up for that and gotcha. all this. Well, I get him first. I'm the first person to work with him to start the day. So if I fuck up or I like, if something doesn't go right on my set, I push oh. all, I push everything out of schedule and behind. Yeah. And so and if you put him in a bad mood that, that, you know, like I set the tone, totally. I set the tone for the day. Yeah. Which was, I was, I don't get nervous. I was nervous that day. Dang. Um, and part of it, so we get there that morning to set up and photography is always looked at in the video world as in a lot of my friends who are in the video world will laugh when I say this, but we're like the redheaded stepchild. Like, hmm. You're like, oh, you're a peon. Like, you're just a photographer. Because like it's, video is just so much bigger and more important to take it. There's so many more people involved. It's more and, complex. And, yeah, it's more complex okay. is the way it's looked at. Okay. So you're just going, Fa-cheek. yeah, is what they think. <laughs> um, and so, like, we didn't have the basic need that I what I just needed, like, I needed stands and sandbags. Like I had, I brought all my equipment I needed to shoot with, but to do our set, we needed, we needed to drape these red things. And I was like, my needs from the grip company was, it was like 16 C stands and, uh, like 20 sandbags. And we get there that morning and they're like, Oh, we're out of sandbags. And it was like, how are you out of how, sandbags? I'm like, how I, I like, I, well, they were like all the other companies oh, okay. took that. So it was like, we had to go, so we were spending time trying to go like go borrow sandbags from sets and stuff. So, um, and then the wind was blowing like crazy. So we was just trying to get all the stuff set up. And then um, I remember it was the only time I would sort of aggressively told my assistant I had working with me because he was he was like we might need to bail on this idea, and I was like bro, we can't, I was like, no, figure out a way to make it happen. Like, this is what we were hired to do. I'm not, ba I'm not telling the client we can't do this. And so I was just like okay. aggressively. And I, I apologized to him to this day. I, was, I felt like I was, I was polite about it, but, you were but I was like, get it done. I don't care what it takes. And that's, you, I've never said anything like that to anybody, but it was like in the moment I had to do that. 
Um, and we pulled it off and we, we got the, we got it done. But I, like I said, I'm the first person to go. So they, and so they're like on a PA system or they have like one of the, um, what are the things called? Where Those you're, megaphones. You're like so a they're megaphone. Like the red and they're like yeah. They're, they're like, yeah. Mahomes will be on set in two minutes. It's like, okay. It's like, Mahomes will be on set in one minute. It's like, like, okay. And then they give a countdown from 15 seconds. And I'm like, what is happening? <laughs> and like, everybody is, is like, I've got a crowd of people behind me, yeah. like waiting. Like, I've got video people. I've got, uh, I, I mean, it was probably 30 people like watching me. And I was like, okay. Jeez. And he walks out and, and so it was like 10, 9, 8. And they're like, and Mr. Mahomes is on set. Uh, your time starts now. And it was like, am I on a game show? Like, what Seriously? is happening? It's like, I've never experienced anything like oh, that. My word. Um, and so we start firing. And okay, so you normally like to talk to your... Yeah, so I don't get to, I don't say a word with again, it. I don't know. Yeah, no introduction, no anything. He just goes to his mark. And... Um, and so that's, that's really peculiar for me yeah. to just have somebody walk out and maybe for him, it's not, yeah. you know, because he does so much. Sure, yeah. Um, so I just start going yeah. and then I'm firing like crazy lights are popping. I'm looking yeah. at him over there. Yeah. You TV. probably saw the image yeah. pop up yeah. and the lights are flashing and we're going. And then my assistant tell him, he's like, Matt, you have to stop. I'm like, well, he's like, the lights are overheating. And I was like, what? <laughs> And he's you, like, let me change the battery real quick. Yeah, he's like, I need to change the batteries real quick. And I was yeah. like, okay. So, like, I go in and I, like, show him and I bring him over to the screen and I show him something. And, I like, I buy time for, like, 10 seconds. Yeah. And then he gets the battery swapped out and we go again. And then my time's up. And I, re and I can hear the client going crazy, excited in okay. my ear. Okay. Like, oh, my God, that looks this – is, this is perfect. I love that look. And I can hear them all talking to each other. And so I hear that, and I'm like, we, we get that. And then he goes to the next shoot. Dude, I about collapsed. Like, How long did my, you have with him? I was, it was probably seven minutes. Oh, my God. Yeah. And how many photos did you take? Oh, I probably took 200 in the span of seven minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my word. Um. And then he goes, and then he's going to come back to so my set. So that was set. shoot one. That, okay. Yeah, well, that was like set, set one, one of that day. day. So yeah. I'm like, and I'm walking around like I just won the Super Bowl. Like I, <laughs> like I was so jacked and pumped. That, so I chase that feeling all the time. Okay. Of like that when I had, when it was like this rush of emotion because I knew I nailed the shots. Mm. Uh, the excitement of it, the, just how nervous it was. I was like, I did it. Like yeah. we did it. And so when I, he was going to come back, I was like calm. Hmm. And when he came back, they had the wrong helmet or something. And so they had to go change it. So I had like a couple minutes to chat Sweet. with him. So I was like, okay. Yeah. And um, we nailed the other shots and it was a lot smoother. Um, and I remember we caught a flight out that night we're supposed to fly out the next day to los angeles to shoot day two with other athletes but we ended up flying out that night and got to los angeles and um i was able to like get on the phone my i literally got i i had like tears i was crying when i was on the phone with her i was like just telling her the experience and then realizing what we had done and that we had pulled it off and i'm just this like dude from little pensacola florida yeah was like how is this how like how did i do that and again, I always know how I did it, but I always have to like, I'm always in shock that it's sort of the, uh, what's the expression? Um, imposter syndrome. Hmm. I get, you know, like, yeah. like why me? You're like, how did I do that? Like it was, it was just wild. Um, and then the second time I shot him was for Bose headphones and we did that in Dallas, Texas. Question. Yeah. How did you get from Oakley? You said there was a bow shoot happening at that time. Yes. How did you springboard and capture bows when you didn't have bows? So you went from Oakley to bows. You've now shot Aaron Rodgers and Patrick Mahomes for bows. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. How did you get to that? Did they see your work? On so the what happened? It's it's um, consistency, performance, relationships. So the the production agency that I was doing the Oakley work for. Okay. They got the Bose job. They had to pitch me to Bose and convince Bose that I was the guy to shoot it. And then 
I got, um, and that was with an ad agency out of New York. And so they, tr they trusted that I could do it. So I got, so that's how I got that job. And I also had the experience of saying I've shot with Patrick Mahomes. So, um, that's how that came to fruition. Okay. But when he, I, I think the order of operations went, I photographed Russell Wilson in the morning. Yeah. And then Patrick Mahomes in the afternoon. Well, there was a moment where they wanted Patrick and Russell Wilson to interact together, just candidly have a conversation. They just wanted me to just shoot them talking. Yeah. Um, and so I did that. And then afterwards there was this lull of like a half hour of like the video team was setting up for some shot they needed. I wasn't scheduled to photograph Patrick for like two more hours on his set upstairs in a locker room. And so I had this 30 minute window where it was like nothing happening. And I got to just sit there and talk with him. And again, knowing he had just had his daughter, cool. I have two daughters. So we talked about what it's like being a dad to, to, to daughters and how cool that is. Um, we had talked about, I knew he grew up in, uh, Texas and played football there. So we were talking about the scale of high school, uh, football in Texas. And what was crazy was we were shooting at an indoor high school practice facility, which sounds insane, which sounds insane. And so I asked him, I was like, I was like, when, when you went to high school, I was like, did you guys have an indoor facility? He was like, he was like, like this one. And I was like, yeah, he's like, no, this one's a piece of shit. I was like, what? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, he's like, no, was, ours had air conditioning and better lighting. And, and I was like, this is insane. Crazy. I was like, cause what I thought we were in was amazing. Yeah. And I had been to like the New York Jets indoor practice facility and it was almost on par with that. And I was and like, the one he played yeah, the one, this high school one, he's telling me it looked like if it was like a piece of crap. Oh, I was like, word. wow. So, so the money that Texas high school football gets is, I get, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, um, but it was cool to like get the, another opportunity to work with him again. And this time actually just have like unscheduled downtime that just happened. And yeah. he was just super cool dude, just down to earth. Very nice. Um, and then from that shoot, the next day we had Aaron Rodgers. Okay. And the funny, funny memory from that for me was, um, well, one, we had to shoot him unbranded cause that was when they, they, hmm didn't know if he was being traded from green Bay or going to oh, stay. So it was like, okay. Gray clothes. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't get his, he's not wearing his Jersey cause he wouldn't commit to what he was doing. So it was this weird, I mean, we did Patrick and Russell in their full fledged NFL uniforms, but Aaron Rodgers was in like just gray blank practice gear. What do you think of that though? Because wouldn't that put more emphasis on the Bose relationship? Um, or did you not like it? It was it was weird. I mean, I understood it. I, un I understood why they had to do it. Um, it, but we made it work. It, it was practical. Like it looked like he was at a throwing session for practice. So it yeah. wasn't, it was just funny to do two quarterbacks and they're full fledged yeah. all their gear. And then you just have this guy in a gray t-shirt. Yeah. It was like, whatever. Uh, so I tried to shoot this like iconic portrait of him, which I felt like we captured. Um, but I personally decided that I didn't like Aaron Rodgers because I'm a diehard, I'm a diehard Patriots fan. Okay. So I'm like ride or die with Tom Brady forever. Yes. And everybody had always said Aaron Rodgers is a better quarterback than Brady and all this stuff. So it was like a Brady fan. I was like, I just don't like Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> so in my mind, I was just like, he's not. I'm going to shoot with this guy. But, yeah. Uh, I'm not gonna get but I don't like him. And then when <laughs> there, um, we were waiting on video, the video team uh, to, to wrap up their shot. And then I would have like five minutes to get what I needed with him in the locker room. Uh, I asked him to look a certain way. I was like, look this way. And then I was like, we need to look a little bit more stoic. Um, and I gave him a little bit of direction. And he was like, he threw out a line from Zoolander. And he was like, do you want, he's like, what look do you want? Do you want Antigra? And I was like, <gasps> He you just, just used Zoolander. Qu and so our banter for the next five minutes was nothing but Zoolander quotes. Oh, that's wonderful. And I was like, I hate it, but I actually kind of like this guy. Oh, that's great. I was like, he's kind of cool. Did somebody throw out the crazy pills line? <laughs> um, I don't remember. That's one of my favorites. Yeah. <laughs> I, I might have, but yeah, it was funny. And then we came back. So 
we had to go to another set with him and then we circled back around and I was photographing him again and we, we just kept that going. But he, he looked at me like his relief because he was, the video side was pretty intense. So it was like when there was downtime for the photo, he could relax and joke because when he was doing, cause he can relax and joke. And then I can tell him to like hit this look real quick. And then we shoot, 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 shoot. And then he can breathe. But when you, you know, shooting his video, we had to like go through these motions and they had to do it over. It was very stressful. So gotcha. it was funny that I was, I could tell that we had this connection and I was like his stress relief in between the shots for video. That's so so cool. I didn't want to like him. I didn't like him, but I tell people he's a pretty cool dude. <laughs> So he's cool under the circumstances. He's cool, I guess. He likes Zoolander. He likes Zoolander. So are you a big Zoolander fan? I'm a big yes, yeah. I love Zoolander, but I'm a huge like comedy guy. So okay. yeah, it's like one of the classics for me. That's a good one. Yep. What is an athlete you've yet to shoot that you have on your on your dream board? Uh, dream board. I'd mention Tom Brady. Okay. So I can say that I have photographed Tom Brady. Um, I was probably three feet from him. I, because of my relationship I established with the New York Jets from shooting their uniform campaign for Nike, okay. uh, they, the Jets organization has hired me back multiple times over the last couple of years for media day internally for them. So I work with their team of photographers and I help them. There's usually three, four, or no, there's probably like five sets that they have to get for different looks for media and press packages. So I go up there. I help them light the sets. We sort of get collaborative on what we're going to do. And then they put me in charge of the action set. Uh, like I shot the uniform launch same way that I did that. And I capture the athletes hitting these, you know, athletic poses or the peak spot of how they're supposed to perform and look. Hmm. Um, and from that, they know that I'm a diehard Patriots fan, which is funny because I hate the jets as a fan. Uh, but it's a, it's a great organization, great people. Yeah. Um, and I do like going back up there and shooting with those, that, that team. But from there, he was like, uh, Dan, who's the, the head photographer was like, if you can get to Boston, I'll get you on the field for a game. He's like, we'll get you a press pass and you can cool. be up there. And I was like, okay, I'll do it. So I had an assignment in New York. Um, and so instead of just going back home, I had booked a flight and went to Boston to go to Foxborough for a Patriots game, met up with him. I got my media pass. And at the end of the game, he was like, I'll get, he's like, the only thing I want from you is like, shoot the game however you want, but I'm not an action shooter. That that's a different. So you're like live sports. Yeah. Like seeing. live sports is, I have so much respect for those people. That is because we talked about being in control and mm -hmm. me lighting and I get to tell the athlete what to do. And all it's and whereas live sports to me is like a wedding on steroids. Yeah, like, like you're just being re chaos. you're being reactive yeah. and you have to be in the right spot at the right time. So, so much respect to those people. That is an art. I can't even wrap my mind around. And they've got to be strong. I mean, those, yes. those, those, those lenses are massive. Yeah. So <laughs> the only kind of thing he asked me is get the quarterback interaction, the handshake at the end of the game. He was like, when that happens, I want, I'm putting you in charge of that. I was like, okay, done. So I'm like, I'm watching the clock tick down. I'm watching the clock tick down. And then it hits. I think the Patriots easily won the game. So they kneeled it with like 12 seconds to go. Okay. And so the second they kneeled it, I'm sprinting on the field and I get right into Tom Brady's face. And I'm like, I'm motor driving and I'm blasting the shots. And I chase him and follow him all the way to the tunnel. So it's like, I got my Tom Brady photographs okay. from that. But my wife says it doesn't count. Because it wasn't like an actual photo we're shoot right? at the level I do stuff yeah. where I yeah. get to tell him what to do. I like to say I photographed him, but my wife says technically I have She's it. like, you still got that one on the bucket yeah. list. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so something with Tom Brady okay. would be top of the list. And what's funny is that when that happened, my mom and dad were texting me because I ended up on the NBC broadcast for the game. Nice. And they're like, I was on the, you know, for like my – my five seconds of fame. Yeah, I was right. like on the, I was like, you can see me photographing Tom Brady, like right there on TV. So it's kind of so when cool. the game ends, media is allowed to just like, yeah. Storm the field, so to speak. Well, yeah. The, you have to have your credentials. You have to have your press yeah. Pass yeah. 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 Be like yep. Approved. Yada, yeah. Yada. Yeah. So that's interesting. Cause yeah. I know like during the Super Bowl, like when it ends, it's like, <sighs> yeah, everybody floods, but I didn't know during normal games that that was like, a, like yeah, a not game. to the capacity that the Super Bowl is, but yeah, yeah, you have your, all of your elected, 
um, you know, credited press pass people that can be on the field. So who have you worked with the most over the past couple of years? Is there Bubba a- Watson. Okay. So you've, you've shot with him multiple times. Oh yeah. Okay. That, that, um, I, he is not with Oakley anymore. So it breaks my heart. I love shooting with Bubba. We probably did a half a dozen shoots together. Cool. So I did the one and it was like, I, I was super happy with the shoot. I, I get, and for me, that was still early on in my career. So I was like, I don't know if I'm ever going to get hired again. Cause I was like the local guy. They mm-hmm. just needed somebody to come in last second. Got it. And because I hit that one out of the park, that's how I started getting more work and, from the, so that that to me that was one of the turning points in my career was so that shoot with Bubba Watson. Bubba was the Oakley launch for you. Yes, got it. And then from there that turned into Oakley to Bose for that production agency I've shot um, Under Armour campaign other and countless other brands. Cool. Um, but I've probably worked with Bubba Watson the most, um, and I've done Patrick Mahomes a couple times, Zion Williamson a few times. Um, who else? Uh, Francisco Lindor, uh, who is the shortstop for the New York Mets. Okay, yeah. I've yeah. done him a few times now uh, for uh, for New Balance and also um, Oakley. And um, that campaign we did for him for New Balance was at the, uh, the end of 2020 during COVID. Um, and it was in between him. And that's a, that was one of the most crazy experiences in the post-production side I've ever done. Okay. I was going to ask that, like what your workflow is like and do you shoot to just shoot and be done or do you end up with a lot of post-production? Why do you say it was crazy? I say that one's crazy. Well, the, I'll answer the question you just asked about yeah. my, my post workflow. Yeah. Um, for over the first half of my career, I, I handled post on all of my work. I retouched everything myself and I did okay. all of that. A lot of my work now goes directly to an agency or a brand who has in, internally a, amazing retouchers. Okay. Um, well, I was super nervous about it first, but now I love that process um, because it takes you know work off the back end for me, so I, I can actually book more work because yeah. I'm more available. Yeah. Um, but specifically going to this um, this shoot with Francisco Lindor for New Balance, I had convinced new balance that I could produce and direct their TV commercial that they were going to do TV. Yes. Okay. Along with shooting the still photographs. Okay. Which worked in my favor at the time because, um, of a smaller set and a smaller production during COVID. Um, I was like, well, you're going to have the benefit of having less people if you let me handle this. So all. you're directing video guys. Yes. So I was, you're shooting I was the still photographer. Okay. So my, so we produced the whole campaign. I was the photographer and then I was the director, um, who also wrote the creative for the spot. Okay. Um, so new balance had this idea that they wanted, Francisco Lindor to look like he was walking through a tunnel and paparazzi was photographing him. Okay. Um, and so we took that idea and sort of went a little bigger with it. Um, and so we had this idea that he would pull into a stadium in his car. He gets out. It was his first release for his signature turf shoe, um, with new balance and we could focus on the shoe stepping out of the car and he's going into the tunnel and he also had his own line of apparel. Okay. Um, and so he was, there were so many rumors up in the air about him not staying with the Cleveland Indians and he was going to be traded, um, because the Indians couldn't give him the money that he wanted. Gotcha. So we shoot this campaign. Uh, we took over the baseball field and the football field at the university of central Florida. So we basically rented out both stadiums. Dang. Yeah. And, um, so we shot the campaign there and then in the post side, um, as this was happening, he got traded to New York. So the scale of, we had to convert what we shot into this entrance into New York city. So you had to literally like do so much post-production 
like visual effects. To some degree, yeah. Oh my god. And word. so we um so at that point we then subcontracted the job out to um the 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 editing side to uh, a production agency in Los Angeles, um, and it was the agency that had been hired that had been hiring me to do uh, all the Oakley work and other stuff. Yeah. They had just started a new division called Locked Editorial, and so I threw work back at them cool. and had them do the post on that, and it was a huge success to see. Um, so in Times Square, they took over the huge curve jumbotron that's yeah. like above where they do good morning america and yeah. multiple screens in Times square and they had that basically running on a loop for a month Whoa. in Times square um with you know the the billboards and the still photographs that we had shot that's so um cool. and yeah so again it's still just funny to look back at doing this massive production for this you know one of the best players in baseball and having that chaotic moment of the scale of like how big it got from playing in Cleveland to now he's like the highest paid baseball player in major league baseball going to New York. And so this has to get to that level. So he plays for the Yankees now? No, he plays for the Mets. Mets. Okay. Um, and to, and then to have that launch and then they're like, Oh, so now it's going to play in times square was like ridiculously, incredibly amazing. That's so cool. Yeah. So it's like it could have been something a little smaller, but because he got traded. Yeah, it wasn't was supposed to be that big. I mean, wow. to me, it was huge. I was like, I'm shooting and directing something yeah. for New Balance. But like, it was like it was big for you. And then yeah, it was big, it was for, big for me. And then it got, yeah, mind-blowingly humongous. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. So I've been seeing, following your, your Instagram, and you are starting to kind of branch out, it looks like. Do you have kind of a desire now to push yourself in other domains, not just athletes? I see you've been shooting some musicians. The skateboards behind you are um, Bear Walker. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Bear um, Walker. And uh, he makes such cool stuff. This Spider-Man series is amazing. Yeah. So where are you, where are you, where are you going? So what I've been doing, I mean, I have not. So we, if you circle back around to me talking about showing what you want to get hired for. Okay. I mean, you wouldn't know this, but I do a lot of healthcare work. You don't show it. I don't show it. Got it. But one of my longest running clients I've had is Baptist Healthcare. I've seen and their headshots. They're very good. We're doing the whole campaign for the new hospital launch. Oh, damn. The whole campus. We're just doing all of the creative. Well, like, we are writing the creative, producing the spots, or shooting the photography, directing the the tv commercials oh um my word yeah but i you know establishing that relationship going back to where i had you know started um that's a client for example that i love because i've worked with them for 10 years hmm. but i'm not trying to like live in the healthcare domain but um i can execute for them we have a great relationship and then my producer who i mentioned earlier um, my relationship working with her started because she was the marketing director for Baptist. And when I was working at the law firm, apparently she saw a TV commercial for the law firm and was impressed by it and called them and asked what ad agency like wrote, wrote it and what production company executed, um, your TV commercial. And they're like, Oh no, we just have a guy in house who does it. And so she asked if she could talk to me. And so they put her through to my office and were like, hey, somebody from Baptist Hospital wants to talk to you about TV commercials. And I was like, what? Um, so that was one thing we kind of skipped over. Yeah. But she had brought me in, you know, they brought me in for a meeting. I was like, I'll go to the meeting. But I was like, I don't know if I can do that. Like I hadn't done freelance work to that scale. So you did this while you were still at Levin. Yeah. Um, Whoa. Yeah. So I went and met with her and I, um, we had a good rapport yeah. and I was like, and then she basically convinced me that I could do it. I don't know that I walked in there with all the confidence, yeah. but she was like, if you just execute it, like you did the law firm commercials, like whatever you do for them, that's what I want you to do for us. And at, from a business perspective, she was, you know, I had to like 
I had to do like an estimate and all that. And that was far beyond anything I had ever done. Yes. And so she would work with me and sort of had discussed what her budget range was and all of that. And I was like, okay, yeah, I can do all, I can, I can make it happen. And I, she didn't know that I was learning photography at the time. Gotcha. So I had also pitched and convinced her that, Hey, if I'm here and you're going to have all these doctors, I'm going to shoot this TV commercial. Do you need like new headshots or anything? And she was like, well, can you do that? And I was like, well, yeah, I actually do. I'm getting into photography and I showed her my work. So I ended up, we ended up shooting photography as a camp, a campaign they used for ads also. Um, and since then I've been doing Baptist TV commercials, um, and photography for a, a decade. And when she left, when she had her first child and started to work from home, I contacted her to help me produce a job for, I was doing for like, um, Procter and Gamble was wow. doing a project in Pensacola. And I was like, Hey, we worked really well together when you were at Baptist. Um, and you were, you know, helping me facilitate the production on the TV commercials. I was like, do you want to help me for a week? Get this shoot off the ground. She was like, yeah, sure. And that's sort of how our freelance relationship started. And because of her background with Baptist, and her working, that helps my relationship with them because now she's, through my my company, she freelance writes the creative, writes the scripts for the TV. She handles all the client communication, knows how to get through the approval process with them and has the inner workings of that client. That uh, That's turned into a really good relationship. She so, had the inside track and now she's just yes. like, I know how this rolls. Yes. I love being in the athletic world. Like I, that's where I felt like I'm supposed to be. But my love of photography, if we go back to what we were talking about, was like the sculpting and the lighting. Like to, you can take the professional athlete out of it. To me, the most interesting feature in the world is a human face. Hmm. And so like I just love portraiture and expression so I wish that I could get more into the, the music world. I, I love, I, I love working with artists and music. Um, and I've had a, I've had a lot of opportunities and done some really cool work with some musicians. That's an interesting industry to sort of break into on that side. Why? I feel like because a lot of musicians or bands internally have their own people that they have travel with them and work mm. with them. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, that they have a relationship already established. So if they have to shoot something for a record or something, you know, the advertising side isn't as big. You don't see too, or let me, hold on. Let me rephrase that. Okay. My focus, I see a lot more branding and, ad representation with athletes than I do musicians working with brands outside of their industry, unless they're shooting an ad for a guitar company or something like that. Musicians are mainly doing work, promoting their work. Yes. Not working um, with Nike. Or yes. Adidas. Yes. Okay. Um, so to me, the, it's just, a, I just haven't cracked that code yet. Um, and I feel like there, there would be a lot more time spent away from home um, and such. So I like the idea of trying to, I want to start working with more up and coming talent in this region or area. Well, I saw you worked with uh, Frazier. Claire Frazier. Claire yes. Frazier. We've worked together a few times. Really um, cool work you shot with her. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And I'm more interested. And so this is from a business per perspective, I'm just more interested in creating the work is I want interesting people with interesting looks in front of my camera. Mm. Um, and so that's probably, you're going to see more of that from, from me is more probably personal work um, to help people in the area coming up, be able to have um, marketable images of themselves to help launch their careers. Um, and then specifically to the Bear Walker stuff, that relationship established from an editorial job, 
I shot for him for like a local. So I still shoot for, I say local. It's a, it's a small magazine out of Mobile, Alabama, um, that I've continued to work for from the start of my career because again, just photographing people, it's from a business perspective. It's, it's, I mean, I, I'm doing it cause I, it's fun. Yeah. Not it. I wouldn't be able to survive if I was just shooting small editorial stuff. Well, you have the big stuff. Yeah. So you can do the passion stuff. So I can do the passion stuff. But Absolutely. what I like is they call So I just shot an assignment for them the other day where it's like, Hey Matt, we've got these like salty fishermen. We're going to have come out to a pier and go fishing. And to me, I, I like my dad's a fisherman and it's like, I love weathered skin. I yeah. love an older look. I like that. Like, you know, the, personalities the stories like so all texture. and I was like and then I'm like they're setting it all up I just have to show up and I get to do what I want cool. so like that to me is what I uh, what I really love um and that and, and I can try things I can I can get creative I can sort of do that however I want to um so I I want to do that more with artists and and uh, musicians in the area um, but, oh, circling back around, sorry, I, I have a scrambled brain and I go all over the it's, place, it's but fantastic. specifically back to Bear Walker, yeah. um, for that magazine, I had shot, um, they did a story on him. So okay. that's how we met was he had just did like his first launch of skateboards with Pokemon. Um, so I shot a story on him and then we just sort of stayed in touch and he contacted me about shooting some s stuff for his brand and he started to get more um, more work. He got his, um, agreement with Marvel skateboards and, or Marvel, and he's making skateboards and apparel and he's just done so much cool work. He's doing stuff with Nintendo and Nickelodeon and Dang. we've just established a good relationship we, where he's in Daphne. So he's like yeah. 45 minutes away. He's like probably five minutes from me. Yeah. That's so crazy. we, yeah. So yeah. we link up and he'll pass the stuff off. We've shot a lot of his stuff here in studio. And so he's a really cool dude. Um, and I've just had the opportunity to work with him some on helping him launch these campaigns for the boards that he's doing. So to me, it's been a good fit, yeah. um, both sort of working at a high level with recognizable brands. So sometimes the lower level stuff offers more opportunity for creativity. Yeah. It's not like you got seven minutes with this guy. Yeah. You, know, you could have two hours. If you yeah. Know. What's funny um, is two, two, um, two projects specifically the client reference that work that they absolutely love that I shot for super small magazines of like portraits of one. Um, there's this, um, African American gentleman who proclaimed himself to be the Southern cowboy or something like that. And I went to some little town in Alabama and photographed him in his little, his little shed and around his, his home. And we created these real cool portraits um, and the production company that hired me for, to shoot the campaign for Nike for the New York jet shoot specifically referenced seeing that work and loving it. Well, he saw work I did in slam magazine yeah. and then he searched me out and I had just posted those images on my Instagram and he commented on that. And it was weird. It was the first time I had ever gotten work from or communication through Instagram. Yeah, Yeah. So he's like, Hey, I'm sending you a DM with my phone number. Please call me. And I was like, what? And then it ended up being a Nike job, like my first job for Nike. And I was like, what? That's crazy. Yeah. And then come to find out I've established a real good um, relationship with the creative director for Oakley. Um, he was interviewed or asked one time about something about work that I did. And he had referenced a portrait I shot for a super small magazine. And he was like, that, he was like, that portrait made me feel like I wanted to work with Matt. And the look that he got is what he wanted to have established with um, one, you know, athletes that they were working with. So it's funny that, yes, the smaller work, yeah. just being, tr I, I, I treat any subject I work with the same regardless of scale. Like yeah. the fishermen that I would photograph in Mobile, Alabama, I'm going to light and talk to the same way that I would, um, uh, Aaron Rodgers or, yes. you know, it's like it's, I'm not doing anything differently. It's all the same to me because at the end of the day, I want the work to me. The satisfaction is the result in the work and the instant gratification of seeing what I created on the back of the camera, on the computer screen, when I'm doing it, I'm like, that's the high that you get. And that's the feeling that you're always chasing. Yes. I figured out a way to have a business 
and um, provide for my family. But at the end of the day, it's like, it's all because I'm so focused on making something look really cool. Yeah. You love what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. In regards to showing work, you started narrow. Is that correct? Did you start just showing the sports stuff? Cause that's what you it was. Por- it, well, it was portraiture. It was like, portraiture. it was very lit, dramatic portraiture. I didn't have a ton of athletes at the okay. time. So when I sent that email to ESPN, they, I mean, there was only a couple, what did I say? 40 images. There's yeah. probably seven, eight that were actual like sports related stuff, but it was all consistent portraiture that fit together as a narrative it was the body of work stylistically played well together and then she saw the sports ones yes she could she could imagine yeah and specifically what i was hired was i didn't shoot an athlete for my first portrait with espn really no it wasn't an athlete it was a college student who made this ridiculous dumb face he made the goofiest face and what he was known as the alabama face guy his name was jack blankenship and so he was a fan. He was a fan, but what he got his what he where his fifteen minutes of fame came from was you know how you always see at college games or something there's like huge cutouts of celebrity athletes' heads and they're yeah. behind. Well, he made this stupid face of himself and he printed it super large and he and I can't even begin to replicate the look, but he would take his own face and hold it up. And he just started getting recognition on like ESPN and networks. And then he got brought on to Jimmy Fallon's show. Oh my and then word. he ended up while he was in New York, he went to a New York Knicks game and brought the cutout and Beyonce and Jay-Z were at that game. And then there's camera moment where they're showing him and then they're showing Beyonce trying to replicate the face. Oh my God. And so he turned into this like, you know, 15 minutes of a famous. Yeah person so a meme so to speak me, yeah, yeah. Ma- maybe it was before memes got memes, started yeah. i don't know but <laughs> so they so they wanted to feature him in the fan section of the magazine okay so it wasn't i didn't have this like big athlete um a lot of high pressure you know shoot it was oh go photograph this college kid who makes a dumb face so it was like the perfect assignment where it's like i can't mess this up that's great and it was again it was and so it was my portraiture, it was my lighting, it was my style, and a lot. And I did have a lot of goofy stuff in my portfolio too. Like I love comedy, so there were lots of dumb things with people making stupid faces. So the fit was just like yeah. So it was perfect. like it made sense. Yeah. And then from there, I did start to you know I came back and in the span of a couple months, did some more stuff with more athletes. And I think because I was a vendor, I was in ESPN system. This photo editor recommended me to another photo editor internally. They knew my location. I executed that shoot in Tuscaloosa. So they sent me to Auburn and this time it was with athletes. And so that's how those opportunities came. So you're, you're ready to strike. Yeah. And the opportunity came. Yep. I just think, you know, a lot of times when, when we get started, we feel like, like you said earlier, we have to be broad. So just in case somebody notices something that we might do, yeah. Pick us. Yeah. But so you're going broad later in your career. A little bit. I don't know if I'd call it. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Never really thought about it that way. But you asked about being narrow. Yeah. I feel like I was narrow in the sense of very specific. I wanted to photograph people mm-hmm. and I wanted to only do, I wanted editorial and advertising. Okay. And that was it. I wasn't weddings families that or I wasn't say yes to everything people are in all those things. Yeah. People were in all those things, yeah, but right. no, it was, I want to focus on what I can control, how I can light it and giving direction. Cause that's all the formula and recipe to result in my style. Um, and so, yeah, so I was narrow focused on that aspect and because I narrow focused and I said no to so many things, I forced myself to showcase the work that I felt I could do. And then, and then I started to hyper focus on getting more athletes and shooting for more sports brands. And so now, I mean, I don't know if you could say I bottlenecked it into that, but I'm, it's not that I, it's not that I haven't been shooting other things, but I'm, I'm more comfortable showing all of that other stuff, knowing that I've personally heard from the 
the biggest creatives in the world working for these huge brands that a lot of the work that they love that I've shown that you can trickle and maybe find in my Instagram was just portraits of people. Hmm. So, so you don't have like, you don't have to only shoot athletes. You don't have to only show that stuff. I think for a long time I thought that okay. and I did that, but now I'm, I'm not afraid to show whatever. If I li- like, I, I just need to show what I like. Cause it'd so, be the, the yeah. best of you, of your work. Yeah. So it's not that I'm like opening up to work for more companies or agencies because I, again, I do that stuff and it's behind the scenes to you. You don't see it. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, I just went and shot, I just shot a series of headshots for a law firm in Alabama. I did some internal, super comedic, funny stuff for a branding agency in Mobile. Like I have these relationships and I do all of that stuff. Um, but you don't feel like you have to show it. No, I don't have to. I can what I want to, but I've established my stuff myself to where I'm consistently working with the people I want to work with. So what, uh, what makes you come alive as far as, um, just like side hobbies, hanging out with your kids. So I'm a father of three, three children. Um, I've got a 17 year old, a 15 year old and an almost 10 year old, almost 11 year old. Um, I am heavily involved in, um, basketball, which I'm super passionate about. Um, and so if I'm not just hanging out with my family at home, um, it's, I'm probably in a basketball gym coaching or, or working with somebody or, or helping an athlete get lined up with a good trainer that I like in the area. So yeah, you have so many connections now from all this in the industry. Mm Mm-hmm. So using that to help people get to positions where they yep. can be seen. Yeah. But I'm a, I'm a homebody. I'm a family guy. I'm, I, you don't find me out anywhere, uh, you know, outside of being here or if I'm working on a shoot, I'm home. My wife and I like to host some friends and just chill. I'm, I'm pretty, uh, pretty low key. So cool. Cool. Same. Love it. Yeah. Okay, you mentioned last things you mentioned uh, musicians. Who is the musician that you would fall over to photograph? Oh, never thought about that. Um, I'm super thankful that I have photographed uh, one of my favorite bands is the X Ambassadors. Okay. Um, I got the opportunity to. Uh, I I, be- I got hired to go to the Bonnaroo Festival in Tennessee, and I was their special guest on stage, um, in the pit, in their, uh, trailer. And ba- I photographed their show for them, which was incredible. So basically you just documented the whole yes. time they were yeah. there. Yeah. Um, so again, like pinching myself, like I've worked with these crazy, ridiculous athletes. I have photographed some of my favorite musicians. Um, so I'm very thankful for that. But if I had the opportunity to photograph somebody, Oh, uh, it would probably be, Macklemore and there's a specific reason. Okay. Um, and it, it is tied to my photography career. Okay. Um, so we, we've jumped all over a timeline here. So if we go back in time, um, the 2011 Mark, I did that project 2012. I won a contest um, there's a, there was a, um, a professional photographer in Seattle named Chase Jarvis. Yes. Okay. Heard who's, him? yeah. Who's responsible for creative live and all of that. Um, he was doing a live, uh, starting to do a live show weekly and he was doing his first show with a studio audience hmm. and I won a contest and I, so I got to go be a part of that audience in Seattle and it was the whole focus of the show was how to pursue your career and like chase your dreams. And his guest was Mac Lamore and Ryan Lewis, who at the time I was like, I never heard of him or them or whatever they were. And so on the flight out there, I found some of his music. And um, so I was in the studio audience for that and got to sit there and listen to them talk about how they were, you know, chasing their dreams and trying to turn music into a career. And so this is before thrift shop and all of that stuff came out, that album came out. Um, and we had a private concert done 
for us at that show. So it was like very intimate. There were like 18 people and that was it. Um, and so I got to talk with them and chat with them. Um, and so that was the, that was also the moment when I realized I wanted to start pursuing photography more seriously and figure out how to, um, uh, how to turn it into a business. So I left that experience with the mindset I'm flying home. I'm like, I'm going to quit my job at the law firm. I'm going to do it. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to quit. And I land the second I land from Seattle back in Fort Walton beach. My wife calls me or she texts me. She goes, Hey, pick up a pregnancy test on your way home. You're like, not going to quit. <laughs> and I was like, wait, what? <laughs> no, I'm quitting my job. We can't do this. Um, and so I grab a pregnancy test and I get home and she takes it and she's like in tears. Cause we were like, are we done? Have we had two kids? We're like, are we done having kids? We're we gonna have a third one. We don't know. And then it, we didn't plan for it. So you had we also didn't plan to not have it. Your gap, right? Yeah. Uh, for four, four, yeah. Four and a half years. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. and so it was positive and she was like, she was a mess okay. and she was like, why aren't you freaking out? And I was like, well, what's freaking out going to accomplish? Like it's happening. Yeah. Um, and so that was when I started to really, um, focus on how am I going to do photography? Um, and then we had our daughter and I got those first couple little assignments. So then I started to set the goals and that's when in 2013 I had the, the goals, like I'm going to shoot for ESPN. So I'd, yeah. I'd written all my goals down. I was like, these are the steps it's going to take for me to get there. But that's the reason I said Mac Lamore is because I had the opportunity to like meet him before he blew up. Um, and then my career for me personally took off. And so it'd be really cool to circle back around like a, a decade ish later and have the opportunity to photograph him for something that inspired me, you know, 10, 11 years in the past. That's so cool. So that's why, I, that's why I say him. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I do, I do love listening to his music, but probably for that reason, I, I, I'd say him for a musician. Cool. Uh, one thing you would leave to, let's say you, when you first got started or an up and coming photographer who wants, who wants to break through in a certain industry. You have to, um, I talked about being a, a good person, which sounds really cliche or so simple, but like you got to you can have your goals and focus on what you want to do, but you got to treat people correctly along the way. Um, you have to really foster your relationships and nurture those. And every person you meet is a stepping stone or a connection to the next person. Hmm. So really making sure that you, all of your communication and your follow up, even if you do something for free, um, the way you treat that person while you're working with them after sending thank you notes, emails, um, being thankful if somebody gives you the opportunity to meet with them for 10 minutes over a cup of coffee to ask them questions. Um, and just always staying in contact cause you never know when that is going to circle back around or reciprocate or how that's going to grow, um, is a, is a huge key. And then it's, it, it's all, I mean, it's literally believing in yourself. It, it's, it's, being able to recognize what you think you're capable of trying to help yourself identify the steps to me, it's like reverse engineering. It's okay. I want to get to this level. How do I get there? You just don't sit there and hope or, hmm. or pray that you're going to make it. You have to establish, you know, a, a working path of, okay, well, how do I get to that point? And again, going back to the ESPN thing, it's like, well, they have to know I exist. So one, it starts with an email. Yeah. And two, I had a full plan mapped out that came to fruition like that for me. But like I had a year long process. I was ready to follow, to stay on their radar and keep in communication. Keep, it was like, I was going to make them respond to me. Yeah. Um, you know, I wasn't going to like run into the building and like abduct anybody, but like I had a process of like, yeah, it's going to take a year. It's going to take 12 emails. It's going to take me sending four printed portfolio pieces to you. But like I established a plan and it happened a lot quicker. Um, but you were prepared in case. It I didn't. was prepared. Yeah. Like it's, 
really focusing on what you want to do. I mean, it's like any goal. I mean, don't, don't say, Oh, next week I'm going to hmm. good do That's like, no, do it to start it today. Do it today. Start now and go and, and go after it. But, um, yeah, being able to figure out how I could go from being underneath a ceiling of working in a corporate structure and a nine to five job. And my salary was only going to incrementally grow like 1% a year to being able to break out of that and understand or control my growth has no ceiling. Hmm. I could grow or scale my business as big as I want it to be or as little I'm in control of my time and how I want to spend it with my family now. Um, and I, I, I tell, I, so my son who's starting to look at colleges, I'm telling him now from the business perspective is I want him to try to, um, focus on doing a minor in, um, finance or business. Like he, he's, he wants to go to school for game design. He is hyper-focused on that. That cool. is absolutely what he wants to do. But I'm like, study business, study finance. So you understand money yes. and how that works. Um, so being able to, it, it, so if we're talking specifically in the creative industry, there are a lot of creatives who don't understand that. And that's the biggest downfall is not being able to successfully run. There's the, there's the art of being creative. Yeah. But then how do you sustain that as a career? The, so yeah. understanding money, finance and business is humongous. Yes, that means the, the business of art is where the most successful artists yes. can succeed. Yes. Okay, this is an interesting question. As a dad, for me, my wife and I have often talked about our children possibly not going to college one day. Okay. Why do you think it's a good idea for your son to go to college? Um, I think it's a choice that he needs to make. I, am, I by no means am telling my kids they have to go to college. Not at all. Um, what I don't understand um, in the realm he wants to get to, um, or maybe he'll discover it along the way, is that if he wants to do game design, I don't know how you get started in that on your own. Okay. Um, so I feel like going through the structure or the system um, – of the college process can help him realize that. And then maybe he, it, he decides that if he wants to go start his own game company or something, he might bail on college. I mean, I, I personally know some photographers who started to study photography in college and then realized that they didn't need college and they just, you know, dropped out. So, um, yeah, I mean, if my daughter, my middle child came to me and was like, um, she had mentioned maybe be taking an interest in photography or something else, but I'd fully support the idea of just, you know, being an entrepreneur out of school if you've got a good idea um, and you want to chase it, uh, you know, so I'm not, I don't feel like you have to, to be successful, you have to go into, you know, um, education out of high school. So there's a the certain path doesn't really matter necessarily as long as you have the drive, the focus. Yes. And can yeah. The drive and the focus is what's going to get you to where you're going. Yeah. It's just what's going to help you get there along the way. And if you, if, if a college offers that education to help you learn that skill set that you need, well then let's figure out a way that you go to that school and you get that education. But if there's another way you can do it, I'm, I'm all for it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm by no means that you, you're going to go to college, you're going to graduate. I'm like, no, dude, what are your goals? Let's figure out, kind of like I did with my own career, let's figure out what are the best steps. And right now, I don't know any other way to do the game design side of it. So if this is the first step you think you need to take, I support it. And if you come to me a year into it and you say, hey, I have this crazy idea or I can do it this way, like, dude, let's talk about it. I'm Cool. I love it. Thank you. You're welcome. I really appreciate the time. Um, is there anything else uh, that you wish I would have asked you during the interview or just that's on your mind? Um, I don't know if there's anything else I wish that you would have asked me. Um, I think just generally pushing the belief in the idea that you can accomplish anything and believing in yourself. Um, your wildest dreams can come true. 
but you have to you have to make it happen. You can't just sit back and hope that they happen. Hmm. Um, you've got you've got to learn to not take things personally. Um, I've been told no a lot of times in my career. I've had a lot of rejection. I've lost jobs or not been hired for jobs or been told that I was one of three and, you know, I didn't get hired for it because of this reason. And, you know, you just take that and you learn and you move on from it. Um, but no, I, I, being a creative professional is difficult. Constantly I have to remind myself that I am good enough and I am capable of doing the work that I'm doing. Um, you have to put in the work. You really do have to put in the work and push yourself and challenge yourself. Um, shoot on your own, create your own assignments, uh, perfect the craft of what you're doing and become an expert at the technical side of it. Uh, cause you go back to that 20, 80, 80, 20 thing that you came up yeah, with, yeah. uh, until you, until you become a master at that, there's that whole other 80% that is that you also have to figure out how to master. And that's an art of itself. And I feel sense. like the people I work with and the people I hire, we figured out a pretty good way to do it. And that's why my client base comes back to me. Front loading the hard skills of the craft and then getting yeah. after yeah. the soft skills, yeah. the organization skills, the relationship yeah. skills. Yep. Yeah, I get a lot of photographers who, you know, want to meet up or have a cup of coffee and stuff. Um, and some I can tell don't listen or they talk more than they ask questions. Um, and they just want to, they're so worried about getting to the level that I'm at where I was like, I didn't, the level that I'm at wasn't like, the end game or the end goal for me. It was in the moment. I just wanted that one ESPN assignment. I just wanted that one assignment. And you wanted to do that assignment. Yeah. Really and then well. from there it was like, okay, well if I can do this, I can do that. Mm -hmm. And then if I can do that, I can do this thing. And then before I knew it, I was like looking back, it was like, I've shot for this magazine, this magazine, this magazine, I've shot for this brand. I countless times have had, billboards up in Times Square, you could travel to any airport in America and grab a magazine and see my work off of a newsstand. Yeah. Um, my work's been draped over the side of uh, the giant stadium in New York and uh, billboards in Los Angeles. And like that, it just all, it all happened. That wasn't the goal. Mm. Um, so I think if you think too far ahead, um, that's difficult. I'm not saying you can't, but focus on the steps like set smaller goals um and try to achieve that so trying to go from the high school student football player to aaron Rodgers, you're gonna miss everything in between so yeah going for so. the going trying to jump the gap a photographer comes to you and they're trying to figure out the secret to jump that gap and you're like just do the work do what's in front of yeah, you. yeah it's a, like i want to do what you do okay well <sighs> You got about 10 years here. Yeah. <clears throat> I, 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 I don't know, man. Everybody's path is different. I think that's what they come like. There's no secret formula. Like my path is my path. My story is my story. How I did it is how I did it. You might find a faster, better way, quicker to get where you want to be. Right? Your, your goals are different. I, you know, I don't know, but all I can do is share the stories of what I did or my thought process, but it doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Yeah. Um, that's why you got to trust yourself, focus on yourself and you have to be able to take rejection and you have to be able to learn from that and grow from it. And I do see a lot of photographers again, talking about, you know, uh, want to doing things at the level I want to do, or how are you shooting for Nike or how are you doing for shooting for this? And it's like, well, on your Instagram page, you have a girl in a bikini and the photo next to that is a family portrait. And the photo next to that is a baby and then a girl in a bikini. And it looks like you shot a wedding <laughs> and then you shot, um, you know, a sandwich yeah. at a restaurant. Yeah. Like w I didn't do that. 
You like, weren't trying to get any social validation. You were trying to. Yeah, get, I wasn't saying. Yeah, I wasn't saying yes to everything. I told tons of people no all the time, and they didn't understand. But I was like, I, sorry, I'm not trying to photograph your family. It's not what I want to do, and I don't mean that to be rude. Yeah, I don't want to photograph your wedding. Absolutely not. You had where you like, were like, oh, dude, there's a stud tenth grade basketball player at Pine Forest High School. I'm going to go hit, hit him up. I want to photograph him for free. Yeah. Cause I want to do it. Like that's what I want to do. It's like focusing on what I, what you want to do. And that gets me back to the importance of a job at first. Yeah. If you have some, yeah, I couldn't have, I, family. I couldn't have done that. If, if I, if I would have just, if I came back from that Seattle thing and just quit my job and I didn't have everything in place, I, I don't think I am where I am today. I, I would completely agree with that. Hundred percent. Yeah, it was a side. I mean, the the trendy word or phrase now is side hustle. Yeah, F photography was a side hustle for me for two years. Yeah, it was a hobby, and then it was a side hustle, and then I took that side hustle and turned it into a career, and then I grew that career to the scale and level of what you see today when you look at my work. Yeah, and I get to live here in this area and raise my family here and people are shocked when they find out I don't live in New York or Los Angeles. So totally that's, that's the perfect place to end it because that to me is like, it's not the path, but it's such a strong path and it's such a humble, patient, diligent path that most people can pursue and, and make something of it. It's my path. Yeah. And you have to make your own path. Yeah. Oh, and you're, so in true. you're in control of that. I get so stuck on like the path though. <sighs> you have to understand. Uh, I didn't, I, I, I took a, when I right out of uh, high school, when I was in college and I was trying to study, uh, I got a degree in digital video and TV broadcast. One of the prerequisites I took okay. was like photography 101. Okay. And I had never held a camera before. I didn't know what F stop shutter speed. Yeah. I didn't know any of that stuff. So I learned like the insane basics. I didn't learn lighting. I didn't learn how to direct people or anything like yeah. that. So, um, yeah, it was a matter of just connecting the dots and every step I've taken since I graduated high school and experimenting with college and, and studying, I'm like, it, it's weird that my path has taken so many peculiar steps. Hmm. But if you take any one of those out, I don't know where my journey ends up Dang. or if I'm, if where I'm at is where I'm at. You, I think you just have to trust the process along the way. Um, yeah, and that's where it's, people expect that there's some magical formula, and there's not. It's belief in yourself. It's drive. It's passion. Um, it's hard freaking work, dude. Um, but it's it's your path. Like that's probably the best way for me to end it. Is you have to write your own story, but you got to pick up the pen and write it. It's not going to write itself. That's it. Let's end it there. Okay, Matt been a pleasure thank you so much thank you yeah